As long as they think that only those others are being victimized, then that's okay. It, it, as long as it isn't happening to us and they don't see, they don't recognize what's happening to their own children with this ridiculous situation we've got going here. Okay. You know, the vast majority of people on the face of the earth are not white. We need to learn how to get along with all kinds of people instead of just one kind. The earth, the world is getting smaller every day. We need to know how our children need to leave our homes and leave our schools and leave our communities knowing how to relate to many, many different kinds of people. But we haven't been teaching that. That has not been part of our education because we have been quite convinced that we're, white people are going to have the power forever. That's one of the really thing, the scary things about what's going on right now is by the year, what, 2040, white people will have lost their numerical majority in the United States of America. And we are scared to death. What if people of color get power and they want to do to us what we have done to them? We've got to stop doing what we're doing, if for no other reason than for self-preservation. I see a lot of evidence that for the vast, and I mean like 99.9% of white people uh, that I've talked with, that I've seen just judging by uh, the behavior, uh, white people view white supremacy as their means of self-preservation. It seems, and I'm just going by the logic, it seems that most of the white people, they have just concluded that they need to continue to practice the system of white supremacy in order to preserve the quote-unquote white race. Most of the white people that I've talked to and just, as I said, just making an evaluation based on what I see, uh, they view the end of white supremacy. That would mean the annihilation of the white race. And some white people have said as much. Uh, many of them have been very explicit about that. Um, Absolutely. And that, what do you think the right to life movement is all about? Wow. Wow. That... <laughs> you really think it's about we must we must not allow these abortions because it's immoral? No, it's about we've got to keep these 60% of the aborted fetuses that every year are white. If we could keep – and there is a book. A man has written a book that says that very thing. Ben Wattenberg. Oh. Have you read his book, The wow. Birth Church? Please tell me his name again, please. Ben Wattenberg. He's a brilliant man, absolutely brilliant. I think he's still alive. Read his book, The Birth Dearth, and you'll get a sudden insight into what the right to life movement is all about. It is not about morality. It is about perpetuating the majority status of white people in the United States of America. Sixty percent of the fetuses that are aborted every year are white. He says in his book, if we could just keep those white fetuses alive, that would solve our birth dearth. He says too few white babies are being in this, born in this country today. And he wrote this book about 30 years ago, 25 years ago. Yeah, I'll take a look at it. Ben Wattenberg? If it, does, if it doesn't frighten you, I don't know what will. He advised presidents, particularly Reagan and Nixon and Ford. Uh, not Ford. He didn't take any advice. Um, the Bushes. You really ought to read the book. It's on it my reading list. Add it to your reading list. What a tipping point for the United States. Let's start with some of the maths, though. From what I understand, immigration is actually tapering off, but the trend we're talking about today is, is set to continue. Yes, that's correct. Uh, we've had a pretty good level of immigration for the last two and a half decades, but in the last three or four years, it's tapered. But that doesn't matter as far as the births to Hispanics and Asians and people from other parts of the world are concerned, because we've already now amassed a pool of native-born Hispanics and Asians who, because of their fertility and the fact that they're a younger part of the age structure where people are in their childbearing years, uh, we are now having many more uh, Hispanic births, many more Asian births, and we're having a decline in white births because the white population in the U.S. is just getting older, including uh, the people who are in their childbearing years. I mean, you're right. The social and political implications of this seem enormous to me. Even America's very identity is being changed. Yeah, I think being an American and what it means to be an American is going to have a whole different uh, aura to it in the next decade or two decades to come. We're really having a divide, I think, emerging in this country between the largely white baby, baby boomer population 
who are now largely in their 50s and above, uh, and grew up in a time when there wasn't very much immigration and very much diversity, and this younger group, which is increasingly made up of Hispanics and Asians and so forth. It's the younger group who's more concerned about schools, they're more concerned about home ownership. The older group's worried about uh, retirement, and uh, is there mo money for that and money for uh, medical care. So I think we're going to have some competition for resources because uh, a lot of the people in this older group don't have personal connections uh, with these new folks coming in, and uh, it's going to perhaps mean some collisions along the way. And is education one of the key things here? Because right now there is a big disparity between the amount of whites who get university degrees, for instance, and non-whites. That's true. I mean, we have a shrinking pool of whites who are in their school age years, and increasingly people who are coming, especially from Latin America, who come to this country whose parents may not be that well educated and are very dependent on our school system to provide them a pathway to college and to the middle class and to skills. I think that's our challenge here in the U.S. because at, the ver at this point, the Hispanic population has a, a much lower rate of college graduation uh, than the white population. And we need to change that generationally if we're going to help uh, build up our labor force uh, with these new workers. And just briefly, is there any concern that these new figures could fuel any anti-immigration sentiment or any non-white sentiment in the country? Well, we've had a little bit of anti-immigration sentiment uh, on and off over the last couple of decades. Uh, you know, older people sometimes have trouble getting used to new, ch new things and changes, especially in the middle part of the country where there hadn't been a lot of immigration in the past and now there's more dispersion into that area. Um, but, uh, you know, I think eventually people are going to come to the conclusion that we need these young people, especially in a country that without them, uh, we would be aging, we would be losing our children, we would be showing declines in our labor force, as is evidence in many other countries. And I think, uh, you know, it's true, we're having a little bit of backlash against this, but my feeling is in the long run, the uh, welcoming idea of America and our history here in this country of new people uh, will prevail. Good morning, I am Anne Salter and you're watching the news from International Business Times UK. The cross-examination of Anders Bering Breivik, who has admitted killing 77 people in two attacks in Norway last year, has resumed in Oslo on the third day of his trial. He is expected to be questioned further about his claims stating he is a member of a so-called society called the Knights Templar, a far-right network of anti-Islam activists. Prosecutors claim the network doesn't exist and will pursue questioning today about his links to other extremists in Norway and abroad. Yesterday, Breivik was confrontational and evasive when questioned about his contacts with other extremists, but he refused to name individuals. The court is seeking to establish whether he is sane and can be jailed. Yesterday, Breivik delivered a statement in which he said he would do it all again and asked to be acquitted. His testimony and that of his witnesses will not be broadcast. His testimony is expected to last for five days. I am Anne Salter and you're watching the news brought to you from International Business Times UK. Stay right here for the latest news and updates. Context of white supremacy. Justice, Gusty Renegade, in for another broadcast, hopefully to share constructive information on the system of white supremacy racism. Uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Today's date is Friday, June 15th, 2012, so I have been told. We will be back uh, tomorrow evening for the compensatory call-in. Uh, that would be Saturday. 16th of June uh, program will be at 9 p.m. Eastern 6 p.m. Pacific uh, definitely try to encourage non-white people to tune in uh, exchange views if you've been doing research uh, if you're working on any sort of counter racist projects uh, observations things that you've seen uh, going on in your area uh, things that you've seen going on in the news anything that you think would be constructive to share with other non-white people uh, definitely uh, look forward to hearing from different victims uh, and hearing their views, thoughts on how we can go about solving the problem, the system of white supremacy. Uh, also, we will have a uh, broadcast this Sunday. Uh, that would be June 17th. Uh, we have been talking about 
uh, white terrorism pretty much since the beginning of the broadcast, but specifically escalating amounts of white terroristic attacks against black people uh, in the area of the world known as the United States uh, in 2012. And we began this calendar year. We began this calendar year with uh, some victims who listened to the program uh, calling in to share about their own incident of white terrorism that happened at the very beginning of the year. They were out. I think it was four of them. Uh, they were out at a restaurant and uh, it all kicked off with a white woman said that consistently about the, the dangers that white females represent and you really cannot sleep on or with white women uh, the catalyst racist female uh, this degenerated into a gang of white thugs random white thugs they didn't even know each other apparently uh, forming like Voltron and violently assaulting one of the victims they threatened a uh, black female who was in the group uh, just really ugly scene uh, and it got even worse as the enforcement officers uh, eventually arrived and of course they immediately uh, went to blame and charge the black people um, this terroristic event has evolved they've been dealing with the ramifications of this episode for the past I guess six months at this point and we'll have one of the victims in uh, this Sunday evening uh, to talk about that episode and how things have evolved since then now you got to get white enforcement officers involved white attorneys involved white judges involved and uh, I think more than anything just really emphasizes the point uh, a lot of things that we've been saying the role that alcohol played in this situation uh, not recognizing and appreciating the damage that white people can cause in a hurry I think this whole incident happened in less than 10 minutes uh, we're talking about consequences that have lasted at least six months uh, from something that happened in less than 10 minutes uh, so that'll be this Sunday it's uh, titled uh, white people can ruin your life in 10 minutes not to be funny but unfortunately to be truthful about the problems we face but that'll be this Sunday uh, definitely tune in will be uh, I think very constructive to get that update and I hope we'll really uh, get more non-white people to be cautious uh, when you go out particularly when you're around white people particularly if you're thinking anybody is going to be drinking uh, just you cannot afford to be lax on the plantation and I'll end there that broadcast will be Sunday at uh, 7 p.m. Eastern 6 p.m. Central and 4 p.m. Pacific uh, this Sunday evening June 17th all right uh, moving forward our study session Dr. Marimba Anis Yurugu uh, you heard some of the clips at the beginning of the program uh, Jane Elliott uh, her third visit she was the first sound clip uh, discussing uh, Ben Wattenberg's book, The Birth Dearth. Mm, we might have a sound clip from uh, Wattenberg a little later in the program. The second clip was from BBC just a few weeks ago, I believe in May of 2012, and talking about the changing demographics in the U.S., more non-white folks, more non-white births. White people have been talking about this, even some of the... Uh, KKK members uh, have been talking about this. They were just marching down in North Carolina. Uh, the final clip, uh, Anders Brevik, who also was talking about the exact same thing uh, and why he went on his murderous rampage uh, shooting up folks uh, in Norway uh, about a year ago. Uh, he's currently on trial. Uh, and uh, yeah, apparently, as you heard in the sound clip, a part of his defense saying, I do it again got too many non-white people here uh, doing it under the guise of anti-Islam the Islamization I think Dr. Welsing talked about that uh, I'll do it again I'm proud of what I did and I should be let go I was defending the white race all very much related to the sections of Yurugu that we will discuss today uh, we should be pages 280 through 350 280 through 350 uh, if the reading session is going too quickly, uh, again, folks would need to let me know. Um, I am uh, comfortable 
going at 70 pages a week. I wouldn't even mind going a little faster, but I know some folks have said that, you know, it's tough for them to, to keep up. Uh, and that, you know, hey, no, no worries there, but you would need to let me know either uh, dialing in or an email or you can write it in the chat room for the time being. Uh, if you, you know, think 70 is too much and, and you would appreciate it, if we'd slow down a little bit, I would uh, not be opposed to slowing down and uh, maybe going back to 50 if you all think that would be better. Alrighty, I'll give out the number and give a section or two that I think uh, is important. Uh, and then again, as I said, this is not really something where I'm looking forward to just getting on to talk and read for two hours or what have you. I really would prefer this to be more of a book club session where people are actually keeping up doing the reading and asking questions and or, you know, just to share their thoughts about things that they read, parts that they thought were important. Uh, if there are parts, if you have been doing the reading and I know people have said it's difficult, if you do have some confusion, certainly dial in, let us know. We can try to clear it up as best we can. Um, but yeah, I would prefer to have participation on this if, you know, folks are not interested, not their cup of tea, then, you know, hey, I, I was really only doing this uh, to help out listeners who said that they thought it would be constructive. If people are not participating, then I would have some doubts about whether or not that is true and or whether people are really dedicated to keeping up with the reading. This is a big book and we're on the home stretch. We are more than halfway through. Uh, people have been keeping up and doing the reading we are getting close. We should only have a couple more sessions depending on the pace that we keep before we uh, get to the end of the text. All right, we are on uh, 280. That would be uh, the fifth chapter, image of others, others being non-white people. Uh, this, the fifth chapter, as I've been saying consistently, I think about, I think once you get through about the first 100 to 150 pages of the book it starts to become a lot easier to read I think um, I, I think particularly with chapter 5 if you have been listening to the cows radio program or if you have some familiarity with the system of racism white supremacy then you should have had a pretty easy time digesting what Dr. Ani shares in chapter 5 uh, particularly about how racist man, racist woman, the images that they project of non-white people and how those images reinforce the Udomorojo, the Asili of racist man, racist woman, white people. Uh, we'll read a section or two. I really want to try to get through chapter five as quick as possible because chapter six I thought was just phenomenal the whole book has been phenomenal but i thought that was um, newer material i think chapter five a lot of this should be familiar this shouldn't stand out too much to anybody as i said if you listen to the cows uh this is on page 284 uh chapter five image of others 284 i guess this would be the one two three third paragraph joel covell and joel covell previous guest on the cows program you can check the archives october of 2010 uh, covell uses freudian analysis to argue that because european americans are white they were able to discover the power implied in the use of anal fantasies on a cultural level the white black dichotomy of purity and dirt but in disagreement, we could use terms of the same analysis to argue that European development has been prematurely frozen in a stage of psychological infancy, anal stage, which people of other cultures outgrow as children. Moving beyond Freud, however, in repudiation of European social theory, generally we can understand Europeans culturally as Yurugu, the incomplete and forever immature being. While in Koval's view, Africans, blacks, represent dirt that is despised universally by human beings on a repressed subconscious level, two other theorists, Francis Cress Welsing and Richard King, also psychiatrists, have quite different explanations. In their views, this reaction is not common to all peoples. They understand European hatred of blackness and of human color generally to be peculiar to white people. 
They argue that the phenomena is very much culture specific. Both Welsing and King focus on the absence of mel melanin as a key to the ideology of white nationalism. In Welsing's view, the European value of whiteness is a defense mechanism growing out of a sense of inadequacy as Europeans become aware of their extreme minority status in the world. This realization caused a psychological response. Through a process of reaction formation, they have changed a desired characteristic blackness color into a devalued one and in reverse whiteness or the lack of color then could be valued. They then created and have sustained a system in which the minority controls the majority, the system of white supremacy. This process in Welsing's view explains the substance of European civilization. Richard King argues that for, Caucasian, for the Caucasian Africans who became demelanated, that is Dr. Ani's term, as a result of their physical survival during the last glacial period in Eurasia, blackness is traumatic. It is associated with the loss of their culture and spiritual consciousness caused by a decreased functioning of the pineal gland which secretes melatonin, a conscious altering hormone, and by their isolation from African ancestors. He argues that Caucasians reacted to this loss with fear of what had become inaccessible unknown. Then they turned that which they feared into that which they hated. Blackness became evil in this process and dialectically whiteness, the known, came to represent good or value. Um, stopping right there, that is 284 to 285. Again, this chapter just reinforces the imaging and how that contributes to this dichotomy, white being good, black representing evil, bad. You see it all the time, uh, both ways, with uh, Charlize Theron, Snow White, the recent adaptation. Uh, just blowing up in theaters I would even say and I have not seen Prometheus so I don't know but I suspect it's even playing out there where I suspect Charlize Theron is the protagonist you all, I think I, I'm sure some of you all have seen Prometheus but I'm sure she's the person that you're rooting for you don't want anything to happen to uh, our fabulous gorgeous white damsel in distress who is being threatened by some sort of space creature I think they're out uh, you know, exploring off the planet there somewhere and some sort of uh, extraterrestrial creature is threatening these white people on this expedition. I suspect it's playing out right there where your loyalties, uh, your sympathies go to the white people. And at the same time, these extraterrestrial creatures, I'm sure they're dark uh, where that is the beast, that is the threat, that is the danger. You see this played up all the time, uh, whether it's in sci-fi where it might be uh, not so explicit, but you see this all the time in the way that black people are represented, the images of non-white people, especially black people. Uh, white people do a lot of work in that area. Uh, continuing, this is on page 286, and I don't want to spend a lot on this chapter, so just going over a few details. This shouldn't be too difficult for uh, Cal's listeners. 286, the nature of the European Udomorojo both defines others as competitors and enemies, and at the same time compels Europeans to leave home where they are least surrounded by those who look and act like them, and to move into alien lands in which they are the strangers. Colonial situations and slave plantations are cases in point. The Europeans' sense of power is exhilarated by the fact that they are among a very few whites who control many dark-skinned natives. Yet, imagine as well the deep underlying fear, the recurring nightmare that someday these natural underlings will get together and overcome them by sheer numbers or kill them in their sleep. Consider the only partially repressed emotional dynamics of a white person in Rhodesia who lived with the fear that at any moment it would become Zimbabwe and that she will be destroyed in the process. In South Africa, the ratio of whites to Africans is necessarily a political issue. And whites are openly encouraged to procreate. 
In America, intellectuals allow themselves to rationalize their fears by identifying ecological sanity with contraception. But it is black population growth, growth that inevitably frightens white America. The thrust of any eugenicist theory is the elimination of non-white peoples and the proliferation of whites. For in the process of making European culture what these architects want it to be, they also make it whiter. Eugenic improvement of the white race presupposes indirectly the destruction and exclusion of other peoples. Uh, she goes on to quote Madison Grant should be familiar with his work as well passing of the great race uh, where he sounds a lot like Ben Wattenberg um, but yeah you all should standard operating procedure you see these these images these ideas all the time even linguistically again with terms like fair shady images symbols that degrade black non-white people and elevate whiteness white people all the time we are unfortunately uh, being smothered asphyxiated uh, by this way of thinking images symbols the way that we talk all the time worldwide moving forward uh, this is on page 289 this is getting to mr ben j wattenberg and uh, you heard a little brief sound actually you did not you heard jane elliott talking about ben wattenberg but i do have a sound clip of him uh, so we'll be able to play a little bit of that a little later on but this is on 289 let us take for instance the argument of ben j wattenberg as expressed in his book the birth dearth and that's uh d-e-a-r-t-h the birth dearth the book is subtitled what happens when people in free countries don't have enough babies Wattenberg does not say, as P.W. Botha, former uh, so-called president in South Africa, that he is concerned less that he is concerned less Africans and other people of color eclipse whites in the world. In fact, he denies that race is an issue. His only stated concern with this sensitive issue, as he calls it, is that according to some projections, by the year 2080, the American majority white European stock of 80% will have dropped to 60% and will still be declining. And while America is, in his view, is not essentially a racist or bigoted country, anti-black or anti-Asian, anti-Hispanic or anti-Islamic, given present patterns of fertility and immigration, certain doubts about the future arise. These doubts, according to Wattenberg, are not those of racists, only those wondering whither we are headed and fearing that where we are going is not where we want to go, to go, all in quotes. He refers us to a book written by Colorado Governor Richard Lamb and Gary Imhoff entitled The Immigration Time Bomb, the Fragmenting of America. The book addresses the issue of increased numbers of non-white third world immigrants while the numbers of Europeans immigrating diminishes. Even that right there, third world. You're not even on the same planet as white people. Um, continuing, Wattenberg's answer to this problem is quite simple. To white middle class Americans, he says, start reproducing yourself. To the Africana, Botha, P.W. Botha, says double your birth rate. Botha says that black people are barbaric. Wattenberg says that the less developed countries of the world need the West, i.e. white people, for that the less developed countries of the world need the West for models of wealth, freedom, technology, free markets, and democratic modern values. The implications are the same. If left alone, Africans and other non-Western peoples will not progress. But for Wattenberg, the issue are those of culture, progress and ideology, not race, or so he claims. What is the problem in this so-called non-racist view? In this Western world, there will be no growth by the early 21st century. Wattenberg calls this the birth dearth. Then there will be shrinkage. He asks, what will this mean for the world? His answer is that the decline in the birth rate in Western nations may eventually take a heavy economic, geopolitical, personal, and social toll. 
Wattenberg is concerned with the good of us all. He says, relying on their technological and organizational superiority, the industrial democracies could protect their position and perhaps even enhance the growth of democratic values elsewhere. How magnanimous! Wattenberg argues that with a decline in population, the Western world cannot share these benefits with those less fortunate, nor can it bestow its leadership. The issue is ideological and cultural after all. Those who threaten the power of democracy just happen to be black. Wattenberg compares the projected birth rates of industrial democracies with those of less developed countries, plus the Soviet bloc from 1950 to 2100. Lest there be any question as to who the industrial democracies are, they are listed. Canada, the US, Australia, Belgium, Denmark, Finland, France, West Germany, Iceland, the UK, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Norway, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland and Japan. Anders Brevik in Norway with the shooting. Bang, bang. You just had, uh, I'm forgetting his name, but the suspected racist, or actually, actually just say flat out racist, who uh, killed a Asian student in Canada just a couple weeks ago uh, and said specifically he was upset about this very same thing. Too many non-white people coming into Canada uh, for just two of the spots on the map. Continuing, in another listing, Wattenberg includes Israel. They are just having massive riots against the black people and saying we're tired of these black immigrants. This is all going on in the last 10 days. With the exception of Japan, all of these nations are white dominated and or white majority nations. They may have different names, but they are all merely provinces of a single white European hegemony. Japan sticks in the craw of the European cultural nationalists included in this list because of technological superiority. But then the Japanese projected fertility rate is also slow, with a median age for the year 2025 projected to be 44. So they are not a numerical threat. Uh, I would also point out something, a, a slight point that I've made consistently about uh, white supremacy with regards to being able to make international calls. I think every so-called country that I just named, I can call for free as a part of my Skype package. There's not one single so-called country on the continent of Africa that I can dial for free. Astronomical rates to dial any country on the continent of Africa, but every one of these countries that I just named that is white dominated, you can dial them for free. They're part of the package. White people make it easy and cheap to stay in contact and communicate to coordinate their worldwide reign of terror. Moving forward. And again, I hope this is, I think Dr. Welsing, when she encourages people to, you know, stay informed of the news, uh, if you look, and particularly if you if you have a global perspective, man, all of these areas of the world, they are having major issues around immigration. And I mean, explicit examples of white people coming out, being violent, making no bones about it. They are not pussyfooting. We are white and we want to preserve the white way of life. There are too many non-white people here. They need to get out. They need to go elsewhere. And we need to resort to any means possible to get rid of them. You're seeing explicit movements in, I would say, most, if not all of these different areas. Uh, we just had a uh, guest on the program uh, in uh, from New Zealand. Right. But a lot of the same things that he was talking about in New Zealand are happening in Australia as well. And we've had guests on from Australia also who talked about this. So I would again just encourage folks uh, pay attention globally uh, to things that are going on. Um, let's see. Oh, I'll, I'll read a little more and then we'll be almost done with this uh, chapter. Wattenberg states his fear. The third world will be growing larger, both absolutely and relatively in decades to come. He then asks, could third world culture become dominant? Could it erode our culture? It makes little difference whether he is considered a culturalist or a racist. From an African-centered perspective, we are our culture. To deprecate one is to demean the other. 
to fear African culture is to fear Africans. Wattenberg makes this fear explicit in effect. He is saying that if there are more of them, their culture will contaminate us. If there are fewer of us, there will be less of our culture and therefore we will have less power. But, says Wattenberg, because the West has so much to give to, excuse me, but, says Wattenberg, this view should not be seen simply as Western chauvinism because the West has so much to give to the world. Here we see the dialectic of self-image and image of other as it functions to fulfill the cultural asili and to express the Udomorojo. The European is the savior, the civilizer. Therefore, the non-European must be the sinful savage. Botha's bigotry is expressed through Wattenberg's blatant paternalism. For Wattenberg, the West is the first world, offering hope of freedom to people in communist countries. Therefore, the most serious world problem is the decline of the West, because the culture bearers, middle and upper class white Europeans and European descendants have such a low fertility rate as to cause a birth dearth among their population. Wattenberg has presented the quintessential statement of contemporary liberal white nationalism in which the image of Europeans and the culture that they bear is remarkable, potent, productive, humane, beneficent, the last best hope of mankind. The image of others that he projects is as being less developed. Therefore, lazy, indolent, poor, less able to develop, therefore incompetent, lacking culture, self-indulgent, dependent on white Western European leadership, therefore non-progressive, unfit for self-rule, unable to plan for the future, fertile and threatening to the American white way of life. The final analysis is that the white nationalists, whether of the Gabino, Stoddard, Botha or Wattenberg variety, is petrified of black fertility because it threatens white dominance. This anxiety is consistent with the European Asili, Udomuwazo and Udomorojo. That's all going over to page 291. Uh, I would encourage folks uh, to remember the program we did uh, with Shafia Monroe, uh, where she uh, is the president founder of the International Center for Traditional Child Bearing, uh, where I think she would profoundly agree with everything that was just said. Uh, she talked about consistently how black pregnancy is... Ugh, are you going to get rid of it? Why are you having another child? She talked about that consistently. It is never looked at as a thing to be celebrated. A black female being pregnant or having a child doesn't matter if she has 20 PhDs, if she's been married for five years, if her husband is making a lot of money. Totally irrelevant under any circumstances. Black fertility, two thumbs way down. Ugh. Can we find a way to get you some more plant? Can we find a way to convince you to go to Planned Parenthood? That is what the system of white supremacy is about all the way around. I'm even reminded of my offer 21. And please do not forget the uh, white person. His name is escaping me. I'm victimized. But he was a guest on the program. The white person who produced my offer 21 suspected racist and I think he demonstrated that when he was on the program however I'm reminded of one of the scenes uh, in the film where they talked about how when white people when they're going to play savior when they go to Haiti uh, he was talking about Haiti specifically they'll go here and say hey we can help you all out give you some food and some other supplies but on the condition that you also take some of our contraception don't want you dark people having too many children standard operating procedure amongst racist man, racist woman. Uh, I will give out the number once again. Uh, it is 760-569-7676 and the code is 564-943-POUND. Thank you kindly, Cynical African. It is Mark Crutcher, the white man who did Maafa 21, suspected racist Mark Crutcher, and he was here 
long, well, I guess relatively speaking, long time ago uh, in December of 2009. Woof. Long time ago, but very informative program. I would say check it out. He uh, also gives a lot of information to support what Dr. Ani is saying. Uh, I'll check the phone line, see if we have any questions. Uh, person on the talk to you line, I suspect our Brooklyn caller. Question, comment? Uh, uh, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Uh, greetings. Uh, should we do? Um... Yeah, um, this reminded me of something I, I saw yesterday um, uh, on, on Fox. I, I don't watch TV or anything, but I was just in front of a TV doing work, and uh, on Fox it said, uh, the most powerful name in local news, and I just cracked up laughing. I just couldn't stop for, like, it said the most powerful name in, in, in news. I just found that really, you know, trademark. Uh you know, the power, powerful. Um, yeah, very interesting stuff. Um, could, could, I, could I read a little passage that I, I found pretty interesting? Absolutely. Groovy. Um, uh, let me see. Um, I think it was 294. Um, talking about media. Um, talking about uh, how how white supremacy, um, I guess, sur survived uh, the immense the so-called emancipation, um, and uh, was uh, continued through the media, um, negative media about black people. Um, let me see, uh, like the third paragraph. Um, in the aftermath of slavery, during uh, Reconstruction in the United States, the late 1800s and early 1900s, the image of the African suffered under a systematic assault of visual propaganda at the hands of American whites. Now that slavery as an institution had ended, the attempt to dehumanize Africans on the part of the European would have to be continued using other methods. It was important to the system of white supremacy that, one, white people continually, continually reinforce their Euro European consciousness at the expense of the African image, i.e., through our degradation, and two, that the Africans continue to act like, quote-unquote, slaves of a new sport and indeed become what Europeans portrayed them to be. The objective of the European was thwarted to the degree that an African consciousness was sustained among people of African descent that allowed them to reject the European created image of them. Um, It was during this period that a Euro-American controlled media began its long career as one of the most effective weapons used to ensure the exploitation and dependency of people of African descent. Black faces were used to sell everything from toothpaste to pancakes. Distorted images appeared on boxes and, tub and tubes, entre my Uncle Ben, and even on vaudeville stages to make white people laugh. But the media had really done its job when black people laughed, too. And in 1987, when black people had arrived, quote-unquote, and could therefore collect these vintage products of a racist media as black memorabilia. Yeah, I, I just found that uh, just on point. Um, I'll just share that. Absolutely. I had that portion highlighted as well. It uh, it reminded me of uh, our guest from Monday's broadcast, uh, Kristen Harrison, and the work that she does around how television boosts self-esteem for white male children. Uh, and just that narcissist, I think that was one of the things that she said on the program, that when you 
can show those sorts of images. It can inflate self-esteem and narcissism to where white people feel. Let's see, just gonna clear my line out here really quick. Uh, where that, where you can inflate self-esteem to where white people they see these images of Hattie McDaniel and Mike Tyson. Uh, acting crazy and singing songs and the help and precious and driving Miss Daisy and on and on and on uh, where you see these buffoonish clowning images or black people sticking a child in a washing machine where it just inflates the Udomorojo of white people it drives the Udomorojo the Asili of racist man racist woman in making them feel yes we are the greatest thing in the history of the universe. Black people are decrepit, foolish, and ignorant. You certainly do not want these people in charge. We have got to remain steadfast and dedicated to white domination. If we do not, we do not want George Jefferson and Wheezy running the world. And I think they have even called President Obama. Uh, they have referenced President Obama and Michelle Obama as George Jefferson and Wheezy. All of that plays into the Udomorojo of white people. All right, and it just it goes right back to what our guest was talking about and why that why these sort of images would boost the self esteem of white people. Uh, caller in Brooklyn, Jeb. Anything else? Oh, give me one second. Don't forget, we'll be back tomorrow. And uh, again, I do have a sound clip of uh, Ben Wattenberg uh, in case folks have not uh, read his book. He has more than one book, by the way. She's uh, talking about the birth dearth, which he did author. But he also has uh, another book uh, that you'll hear him commenting on a little later. Uh, for the folks in the chat room, yes, I did see the Obama boy uh, hoopla. I think this is the second time around that a white person has made a video uh, talking about their sexual fantasies uh, around President Obama. Unfortunately, this time around, I believe it is a black male uh, and just anchoring that to all of the uh, hubbub that they've been making about him endorsing uh, so-called gay rights uh, and gay marriage, quote unquote, gay marriage. <sighs> we can bring all that up tomorrow. Anywho. Um, yeah, our caller in Brooklyn, we'll see if he has any other uh, comments. And yet oh, OK, right now. Yeah, um, I was thinking about, uh, I, I hope there's not too much background noise here, but um, I'll mute my light when I'm, I'm talking, but um, the, uh, I was, look, I was um, doing a little research because I remembered the um, significance of, um, of uh, Prometheus within the, um, you know, white supremacist mythology, the, you know, white people's mythology. And um, it, Frankenstein was called the modern Prometheus. And Pr Prometheus is a uh, kind of like a, the creator of, of man within their, within their, um, within their, uh, you know, ideology, whatever their base, you know, the, that, um, mythology. Prometheus created man against the will of the ultimate creator or whatever, like their Zeus figure. So he went behind Zeus' back and made man and then gave man fire. So it's like this kind of like original, the kind of mad scientist slash God. Um, and, it was, and, and then Frankenstein was called like the modern Prometheus. So I just thought that interesting. Um, and then like Alien is like one of the, besides Terminator and... Um, um, Terminator and uh, Matrix, like the the the, the most uh, profitable, most successful movie franchise. Um, so, yeah, I just found that interesting. But um, this other paragraph was connected to that um last one about the self-image, the, the the negative black self-image is fueling the success of the white self-image. Um, in, uh, on 296, the exigent, um, 296, it's, uh, exigencies 
of the European Udama Rojo. And uh, she says, uh, the functionally successful self-image of the European is dependent on a negative image of others and on the hypothesis of the existence of inferior beings. This is not a universal dynamic of culture, nor therefore of human nature. The natural pride and commitment to self-definition in other cultures is not predicated on, not dependent on... Is it too loud here? Can, can you hear me? Oh, you're fine. Okay, cool. All right. The natural pride and commitment to self-definition in other cultures is not predicated on, not dependent on the existence of other people among whom these cultural selves must be supreme. European world supremacy is part of the definition of European ideology and helps to, de to determine the character of the European image of others. In this world view, the universe is here to be conquered. It is just, i.e. rational, that inferiors should be conquered by superior beings. In this way, European self-definition and self-fulfillment became dependent on a negative image of others in terms of European value and a correspondingly dehumanizing concept of others. We might say that European culture begins its development as a distinctive cultural entity with the aggregation of peoples, the character of whose Utama Rojo is predicated on the image of a world in opposition to themselves and on the projection of themselves into that world as conquerors and as supreme beings. We can identify Westernness as that definition of self and world that naturally views self in a power relationship to other, the rest of the world. In this world, in, I'm sorry, in this view, the Asili or seed of Westernness is the power relationship and was planted very early in the Indo-European experience. As a result, it is in the nature of the European Udamarojo that it cannot be sustained by a merely intracultural ethic or the idea of a self-contained environment that generates the principle of harmony and mutual respect. It is European culture that is dependent on the existence of other cultures. Perhaps the habit of relating to the rest of the world on the basis of an unending striving for power has spilled over and infested the internal fabric of the society itself. Circularly, the need to relate to others in this way can be explained by the functional need to mitigate internally destructive behavior. So, yeah, I found that really interesting, too. Um, just talk about how uh, white people ha use their destruction for their... For, for to create themselves, they destroy to create, I guess. Oh, okay. Yeah, I had that portion uh, of the text uh, highlighted as well. Um, I think that very important point. Uh, what I was saying, I think, when I got disconnected, just that the racist image of non white people reinforces the image of white people as the savior, the conqueror. Um, even when there are no white people present, if you want an example, if you can think of the help or any of the other, or excuse me, precious, that was what I was thinking. Even the films where there are no white people present and you just see black people acting crazy and being stupid, even if there are no white people present, that reinforces the confidence, the esteem of white people because you've got the contrast. This is not us. Very important point among others. Uh, one of our folks on the line with a hand up as well, uh, our Skype caller, do you have a question, comment? Your line should be open as well. Um, hi. Um, I have um, a point on, well, a uh, passage, I guess you could say, on page 303. Um... 
under the subheading, the European response to the non-European Udomorojo, that's page 303. And I'm going to read this block um, right here, but I'm going to be reading it kind of jumping around, but it all makes sense. In the telling of these encounters, the Europeans are forced to interpret the experience in terms of European meaning and definition. Europeans come filled with arrogance and motivated by a lust for power and a desire to possess whatever they find. Because their motives are to usurp, to exploit, and to bring what they find within their dominion, they necessarily come with the distrust and antagonism with which one approaches a potential enemy. Their culture provides them with a natural political astuteness and cunning. They are perpetually competitive and well-equipped to deal in power play. On the other hand, the natives, in quotes, whom Europeans meet most often greet them with open hearts, smiles, gifts, and trust. They commit political suicide. Their culture has not bred them for the necessary hatred and disdain conducive to an exploitive, imperialistic, or effectively defensive culture. Um, then if you turn to page uh, 304, at the very bottom where Dr. Ani is quoting from Sheikh Antatiok, at the very bottom it says, in fact, as it turns out, one of the weakness of black civilization, particularly during medieval times, was the openness, the cosmopolitanism of these societies. The medieval black kingdoms were open to people of all horizons. And today, one of the basic weaknesses of African society is that they still maintain this inherited cosmopolitan trait. I thought that was uh, informative for me on, on why uh, Africans or Black people on a global scale, our, uh, our position in this world declined to the decadence behavior we are exhibiting today. Absolutely. Absolutely. I had that that uh, paragraph, the one with Diop on uh, 304, sorry. Mm -hmm. Um, I had that highlighted and it stuck out to me. I'm, and I'm not picking on him. Uh, you know, it, I, I don't think it would take much of an argument to assert that, uh, Sheikh Anta Diop has contributed a lot more to the counter racist effort than Gusty Renegade, but he did marry a white person. Like every time that I, I see his name or even a statement like that, where he's saying all that and it's like, but you married a white person. Like, ah, it's, uh, it's just a massive contradiction to me. I, I really hope that at some point I can, uh, speak with Dr. Ani to get her thoughts on that because I just, I mean, if you talk about not being prepared to deal with white people uh, and not having a culture, a mindset that is prepared to deal and, and not be open armed, then yes, we love everybody. You're welcome. Come hang out. And he's married to a white. That's, anyway, um, hopefully we'll get her on the program and that can be addressed. But I do think that statement from Diop is accurate. It's right on point. We have not understood white people and have not had. Uh, that ha not having that understanding has really been debilitating with regards to our ability to successfully counter white people. I thought the same thing too. Every time I hear his name mentioned or someone referred to his book or quote something from any of his books, I, I always think of the same thing that you have, like he married a European woman. So I, I just don't know what to say about that, or I can think of to be a friendly excuse would be that it was a different time and era, which was like maybe what, the late 60s, 70s perhaps? I don't know, the mentality then was different compared to this now? I, I really don't know, but I thought the same thing. I'm not talking bad all about right. him. Go ahead, sir. I'm not. I just want to. I'm not talking bad about him. I'm not doing that at all. Go ahead, uh, Brooklyn. <laughs> right on. Right on. Victim. Yeah. Um. Uh, um. Yeah. It, it, I feel like it ties into the object. I mean, you know, the objectification is the. I just 
love her 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 her, her concept of the Ophelia. It's, it's just so sound, but um, it ties into the objectification. Like I was talking to someone the other day, trying to say how like it's like we um like like we kind of like reduce ourselves to being this like cosmetic kind of uh you know, entity, you know, like, oh, like, look at your dark skin and, like, you know, your uh, curly hair, you know, you know, you know, coiled hair. Like, it's like, like, these things are much more integral. Like, you know, how she said, she said somewhere that we are our culture. I think you read that earlier. Like, we, you can't separate yourself from your physical being, you know, so that it's like when we kind of reduce ourselves to just being like a, you know, a pretty picture you know, a nice dark complexion or, like, you know, a little flat, a fashion plate with some skinny jeans on, we forget, like, how how much meaning there is in in our in our universe. And we just, you know, we just go out and pick someone who's cute or whatever, you know, like, oh, a white girl, you know, like, like you know, whoever, somebody that's, like, you know, just superficially kind of... Uh, you know, you choose a mate because they're cute, you know, and they wear nice clothes. It's like you don't really go too much deeper into looking at yourself and what what that that experience is going to, like, what, what it means to be whoever you are as a non-white person, like, what, what those features and what those, you know, just what it's, what it's, what, what's going to be conducive to you fully experiencing <laughs> your life, you know. So. Like we we don't even know we we don't have a scientific. I mean, not that we want to look for a scientific basis, but science is a part of reality. I guess you know, just having a kind of um, you know, delving into like the you know, you know, like technological applications of whatever. And then like, what does it mean to be to be having melanin in your skin? You know, like. People all have all these different kind of ideas of, you know, vitamin D. Like, we can't... Like, I have people asking me if, like, if if I... I don't know. People are just, like, clueless. Like, like this one guy was talking to me saying that he thought that black people couldn't go in the sun because we were already so burnt up or something. And he was serious. <laughs> I swear to God. Like, it's like... Uh, like like, where do the black people come from? The North Pole? Like, they've been, like, indoors? Like, no, they come from Africa. But, yeah, people just, <laughs> we don't have a concept of what it's all about. And we don't even want one. So it's like, got to start somewhere. <laughs> mm. uh, there was another person that dialed in, uh, seven. 7- Three four four last four digits seven three four four. Your line is open. I am asking uh, people whine about the chat room. Why isn't the chat room open? I want to talk and chat with other victims. Uh, now the chat room is open, and I just asked the people that uh, are re- okay. We got four. I'm just asking the people that are in the chat room uh, to let me know if you are keeping up with the reading. We got four responses so far uh three people said yes they're keeping up one person said no i'm just trying to get an idea if you're in the chat room if you're close to the keyboard a yes or no uh that should be three key strikes at most thank you kindly uh four seven three four four seven three four four your line is open yeah hi uh this is uh linda black goddess 13 uh i yeah i was thinking about what you said about in uh you know diop he married a a European and whatnot, but uh, maybe he, you know, like we're all like contaminated and everything. And you know, even though he had all that information, still he wasn't. Uh, he just had a weak moment. <laughs> That's just a theory. But anyways, uh, uh, I was reading down here. I agree with everything everybody said, and uh, uh, I was reading down page number three hundred five. It says. Uh, uh, it's kind of like in the middle, the last in the last paragraph. It goes uh, as as it were among first world peoples by presenting them with their own weakness, i.e., the ability to love, in the guise of a new and superior religion. This new religion state is held up then as a standard behavior, interpreted as a command to love thy enemies. The enemy uh, who presents it to be too politically astute to be affected by his own rhetoric. So it's kind of like. Um, you know, they kind of like 
they take kindness for weakness and they talk a lot of talk and uh, they don't they they talk one way and do something different and it seems like we believe we just believe them because I know when I went to uh, Ghana it's been a, a while back but I know they just treat the Europeans with really a lot of respect and uh, I mean not not that they should treat them bad but it's like I don't know. They kind of look up to him, and I can see all that in in what she's talking about. Uh, kind of like um, brainwashed because I was talking to somebody, and they said, "Well, well, we still need them. We need them." You know, they have that. Not everybody, but the person I was talking to from Ghana was saying, "Well, we need the white people. We need them." You know, so I just say, "Well, I guess it's all part of the brainwashing," and this all uh, kind of explains it and, and the way she. She she uh, explains it like this, so I just noticed that. But anyways, that's all I had to say. That success of white people. She talks about that in the book. Getting uh, even getting the victims to believe that uh, yes, we we've got to have our savior. We've got to have white people. Uh, if anything good is going to happen, if we're going to be successful uh, at anything, we've got to have at least, you know, four or five, eight white people around to uh, help us see the way. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Can I be, uh, uh, can I please? Excuse me? Can I interject quickly? Oh, sure. Yeah. Wow. Um, I was in, I was in Holland today. Um, I was looking for Dr. Neely Fuller's book. And I was talking to one of the bookstore vendors, and he told me, well, I told him I was reading Rugu, and he told me, did you look at the diagrams yet? I was like, well, yeah, I saw the diagrams, but I didn't really look into them or pay attention to them. And I was telling him how, like, there, I've heard that a lot of black people find it difficult to read Rugu. He goes, it shouldn't be difficult because she gives you diagrams that goes along with each chapter, so it shouldn't be hard. I said, what? He goes, yeah, after you finish reading the chapter or any time within a particular chapter you don't really find you grasping it too well, he just said, just go look at the diagram. The things will become clearer to you. I said, oh, okay. So I figure I'll share that with the group in case anyone is having uh, difficulty reading the material. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Excellent suggestion. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Sure. Did the uh, caller in Brooklyn, did you have uh, something to get in as well? Oh, um, I I just wanted to see if I could cap off uh, the part two there with um, a little paragraph. If 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 no one else had anything to share about the chapter. Uh, chapter part two. Um, I wanted to just. Oh, I'll read it. Um, uh, oh, go ahead. Um, yeah, I was looking at that uh, page 303. Uh, Arman, uh, how do you pronounce his name? Kwe Arman. Arma. A R A. Oh, Ayi Kwe Arma. Yeah, Ayi Kwe. That poem or that. That's remarkable. That kind of just sums it all up, and you get a crystal clear picture, especially when he says, like, see their eyes, their noses, such are the beaks of all the desert's predatory birds. And then we laughed at the fearful ones, gave the askers shelter, and watched them unsuspicious, watched them turn into the fluency of our way, turn into the force that pushed us, Till the proper flowing of our people, the way itself became a lonely memory for the abandoned minds. And I just sort of paints a picture of kind of like at that time, there were people that were saying, no, 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 don't do it. No, wake up. But I guess the um, majority of people kind of didn't take heed. So here we are. <laughs> so it's kind of like now we're telling them, then we tell people, hey, you know, uh, racism, white supremacy, you need to become aware. You know, uh, everything is not nice. We're, you know, we're not in Disneyland, and uh, things are what they seem. You know, and people say, oh, 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 everything is fine. We got integration. We can move up in corporations, and we got 
uh, Oprah, multi-billionaire. So you know, progress, and you know, so there are still people saying the same thing. You know, watch out, open, wake up, look, look. You know, so I just noticed that the the more things change, the more they stay the same. You have, to, you know. So I thought that was pretty. Good. I, I really loved that uh, that passage there. At the bottom of 303, and it goes all the way to 404. Hello? Yes, oh, we, we hear you. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's powerful. Some powerful words. Yeah. It 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 it, it, it really um, those are the makers of these are the makers of carrion. The wary ones said, said, do not shelter them. Mm-hmm. And I guess, like, you know, I was thinking about it, it's like, you know, if you look at it et- ethnologically, if you look at what's happened over the last, you know, few hundred years, our arrival here in this area and our interaction with these people, these um, white, white supremacists, like, it's like basically if a rape, somebody gets raped, and then after that rape happens, then, I don't know, like, uh, somehow the two people, the first, the rape victim and the, and the rapist somehow become, like, uh, equals, but then there's this, like, you know, obviously there's this psychological damage and physical damage, and it's like, how, how, I guess, I I guess, like, yeah, I mean, I was just thinking about that, but that's kind of, like, going away from the point, but, um, it's like uh, it's their culture, I guess. It's just it's like inevitable that that their culture would have expanded to dominate the other cultures, and it's not like they, it's not like uh, an achieve, it's not like an achievable goal. It's just like an endless, it's an endless uh, pursuit. Yeah. So it's like they would have, you know, it's not like they really. I don't know. It's like they're they're like. Uh, I guess I'm trying to say it's like they didn't really win. It's just that they need to dominate, so they would never be satisfied. Yeah. So no matter what, yeah. Ter- terrible. Yeah. Kind of like a monster, you know, just hungry and just got to stuff itself and always got to be fed. Yeah, like a vampire. I think we talked about that too, yeah. Yeah, they don't even think that they're right, but they can't stop. Yeah. And that goes it's into the like a... yeah. Go ahead, sir. It's kind of like a serial killer, you know. They have to kill people, and they once they go out and kill somebody, you know how they they come back and they have some. Well, I don't know. Some have regrets, but then they have that urge, and they just have to go and do it again. You know. So yeah, but that's part of the DNA. And they so. project, and the whole thing gets projected on their victims. Yeah. To rationalize it. Mm-hmm. We're monsters. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess sort of like you, we become you, because we've been exposed to them and they've tortured us and then uh, or raped us and we're like the you know how you hold somebody hostage and then you give them food and after a while you depend on the person to give you food and after a while what's that uh, Stockholm syndrome? You mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. depend on them and you just love them and then. Uh, uh, you know, they brainwashed us and saying that we're nothing and we have internalized the racism, all these images, you know, with the Aunt Jemimas and all this stuff way back in the day. And then it's just, and we'll have any, and then the thing about it, we couldn't read and we're just like a blank slate and we couldn't talk our language. We couldn't think in our own language to get out of the situation, you know. Right. right? And then yep. that's all that's, that was presented to us. You know, just like chitlins and stuff. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's all we had to eat. So after a while, it was really good. 
but it's killing us. You know, same thing in a way, simple way. But I don't know. So, so because it's like, I don't know who said that, but even if for some reason, like, if all the white people disappeared, I think we've been so contaminated, we still have a lot of their traits, like competition and, you know, uh, you know, murder and, and killing each other and pro- progress and all those ideas. So, you know, uh, we have a lot of work to do. So, It'd be a good start, though. Yeah. Yes, it would. I did want to get in a couple of the quotes just to show how ingrained the uh, Asili is in all aspects of white people's culture. Like so many of the people that we worship and take for granted that we don't even know about, or I think for a lot of us we don't know about, uh, have, you know, pretty much came out and gave their stamp of approval. I'm a white person. I'm totally down with racism, white supremacy forever. Uh, she goes through the quote just to show the Udumawazo, the thinking, the white world view expressed by so many different people. I'm not going to read all of them, but just to pick out a few of the folks that I thought was really important. Uh, she has Abraham Lincoln. I'm not going to read this because I think it's the same quote that Pam uses uh, in uh, some of their Trojan horse publications. Uh, where he's talking about the white superiority over black people. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe, for how many people who've had to read his works. Uh, I know when I started yeah. studying seriously, he has a short story that is about a monkey escaping in Philadelphia. And the monkey kills this white woman in her bedroom. And this was published at the time when there were a group of black people who revolted in Philadelphia and killed some white people. And this story came out right after this happened. This is in the 19th century. And uh, a white literary critic reviewed this work and says, now you see the racism here? We've been comparing black people to monkeys for centuries. Uh, And even his short stories, it comes out where the black people got to be some monkey and the sexual element that's happening in the bedroom. Uh, I can give you all the a literary critique where she breaks this down and says that Edgar Allan Poe is just writing a racist little story here comparing black people to monkeys. Anyway, uh, in Ani's work on 299, Dr. Ani, she, uh, the quote she gives from Edgar Allan Poe is, uh, our assailants are numerous and it is indispensable that we should meet that assault with vigor and activity. Nothing is wanting but manly discussion to convince our own people, at least, that in continuing to command the services of the slaves, they violate no law, divine or human, and that in the faithful discharge of their reciprocal obligations lies their duty. This is 1836. If anybody is interested in reading that critique of Poe, I can hook that up for you. Um... Some of the old Benjamin Franklin, uh, I, when I began studying seriously, uh, there was a different book that I read talking about Benjamin Franklin and some of the explicit statements that he made whining and whimpering about the fact that there are not enough white people on the planet and there are too many dark people. And I just thought, wow, white people have us making songs about Benjamins. And this guy is a blatant racist, just the massive confusion. But the, the quote she gives why increase the sons of Africa by planting them in America where we have so fair an opportunity by excluding blacks and tawnies of increasing the lovely white and red. Uh, This is from 1753. Uh, The last one I'll give, and there are a lot of different white people that she quotes. Uh, The last one I'll read, she's got, of course, the infamous uh, Dr. William Shockley, uh, but she has Karl Marx. Oh, I'm going to do the last two, Karl Marx and Susan B. Anthony. I do Karl Marx because I've bumped into so many white people here in liberal Washington state where they've been on the, oh, we got to be about uh, socialism and it's class and read Karl Marx and blah, blah, blah. And I I read, I took. Ayi Kwe'i Arma is one of the best writers I've ever, my retina has ever scanned. He is phenomenal. He has essays that will blow your mind. Uh, and what I mean, they will totally deactivate your white chip. He has one that is called 
uh, oh, it'll come to me. Give me one second. On, it's all about Marxism and about how confused black people thinking that they will end white supremacy by pointing to this white guy, Karl Marx, and thinking that he has the answers to the problems they face as a result of white supremacy and the absurdity of that notion. Uh, if I can't think of it, I'll get it. But it's one of the best essays I've ever written. Pretty much anything he writes is phenomenal. Um but I would just point and laugh at people like Karl Marx is a racist. He came out and, and spoke explicitly about how his disdain for non-white people. The quote our, Dr. Arne gives on page 300. It is now entirely clear to me that as his cranial structure and hair type prove, LaSalle is descended from the Negroes who joined Moses' flight from Egypt. That is, assuming his mother or his paternal grandmother did not cross with a nigger. Now, this union of Jewry and Germanism with the Negro-like basic substance must necessarily result in a remarkable product. The officiousness of the fellow is also nigger-like. This is Karl Marx, uh, 1862. Uh, the last one I'll read just demonstrating the consistency in the worldview and what it means to be a white person. Susan B. Anthony, one of my favorites, when the feminists jump up and try to say, we're down to it's the white man. No, it is not. It is racist man, racist woman. Get that white woman back over there. She's not on our team. Uh, Susan B. Anthony, the old anti-slavery school says that women must stay back, that they must wait until male Negroes are voters. But we say, if you will not give the whole loaf of justice to an entire people, give it to the most intelligent first. If intelligence, justice, and morality are to be placed in the government, then let the question of white women be brought up first and that of the Negro last. And this is a reply to Frederick Douglass. And I remember... Frederick Douglass talked about this and he said one of the worst mistakes that he made was supporting those white women for their suffrage rights and thinking, yeah, that's the damn thing to do. And I totally support that. And then not realizing these white women are just as racist as the white men that we've been struggling against. And he wrote before before he passed. And even though that would be a cowbell too, <laughs> that one of his worst errors supporting those white women. But yeah, that's another sad cowbell. Frederick Douglass. Ugh. And he married a white woman, too. Two of them. He married, he married a white two. woman, too. Yes, he did. Yes. Yeah. In upstate New York. Upstate New York. Yep. That's probably the forbidden yeah, fruit, like... you know. Um, Gus, I have a question. I'd like to know your opinion. Um, on the Abraham Lincoln passage on page 298 to 299, Knowing this fact of Abraham Lincoln's position and opinion on black people, why do you think what was the, maybe the symbolic meaning, me, meaning in President Obama swearing in to the office of the United States of America with his hand on the Bible of Abraham Lincoln? Uh, I think it's it's just confusion. Um, I think symbolically, I think non-white people, particularly non-white people that are being showcased by racists, I think they have to do things to demonstrate their subservience to the will of racist man and racist woman. And I think that sort of act, non-white people will see that and read it as, oh, uh, he's, you know, picking out the guy that freed us. And wow, what what a great moment. And he has such reverence for someone who was against slavery and was willing to fight a whole war and kill hundreds of thousands of white people uh, for black people and to save us. And that is great. And he's respecting almost John Brownish. He's respecting uh, a white person who has shown us, you know, that that it's not all white people, that they do have some concern about black people. But if you that only works if you're not informed i think for white people they understand uh abraham lincoln he's down with the team too so you know right on you're just picking another racist uh to put your hand on this bible or what have you and he's in my view symbolically showing his commitment allegiance to subservience to 
racist man, White racist supremacy. woman. Exactly. But I think it gives out that. Con- In fact, it goes to what she talks about later on, which I thought was the most important chunk of the reading this week. That rhetorical ethic suggesting. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, there are some down white people. Oh, See, yeah. he is connecting yeah. to a white person that definitely wasn't racist, who saw this day coming that black people and white people could be free, not racist, and have a republic where we're all together in a wonderful democracy, and nothing could be further from the truth. It's totally supporting that rhetorical ethic as though we are not racist when you have to do the reading to know yes we totally are it's every one of us even Abraham Lincoln you're only confused if you're uninformed and they know for non-white people we're the ones that are uninformed and going to read that as though it means something more than racism white supremacy that would be my view and my last comment on this on Abraham Lincoln and Obama um, to me it symbolizes the 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 breaking apart of the United States, in my opinion, again, um, I say again because Abraham Lincoln lived and died during Reconstruction. At the end of Reconstruction, the system known as Jim Crow was already like being fermented, then instituted, and being, you know, pretty much the rule of law for the South. I'm thinking today, uh, President Obama, and we as a people currently are in, are like a rendezvous of quote-unquote Reconstruction era in a sense that everything we have quote-unquote enjoyed in the past, say, 40-something years as, non-white in this country, I think it's going to come to an end with President Obama in office, whether he's in office for four years or eight years. Um, I don't think he's going to make it for eight years. I think he's out come November. But uh, it just seems like history is repeating itself in the context of white supremacy with the example of Abraham Lincoln and our current president, um, Barack Obama. It's a good point. Good point. And what makes it even more complicated also today is that it's not only happening in the United States, but it's, this is happening worldwide. But with the United States currently at the helm of global power, which is slowly declining. Excellent point. Yeah. They, go ahead, sir. Can I add something? Yeah, it's just like, I guess they're, they're going to go into it later, too, but um, I guess part of the rhetorical ethic um how they're saying, like, oh, you know, we keep on getting it wrong, this whole, like, you know, you know, this whole uh, America thing. We keep on, oh, we just messed it up again, man. Too bad people are disadvantaged. As if that wasn't the goal. Like, they they, 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 they take the exception to the rule to be, like, the um, aspiration of what they're really trying to do. But it's, like, that's that's not really what the aim is but they trick a lot of people even some of themselves into believing their own rhetoric so I guess Obama's just you know he's confused yeah <clears throat> I have a uh, question. Yes, ma'am. You, you think uh, Obama, uh, if we sent him a copy, he would read this uh, Yoruba book? Uh, Dr. Chinese book? Mm, 
I don't know. He has a lot of white people around him. Um, might be kind of dangerous to have this uh, in his position. Um, actually, though, but I just from reading, I could be totally incorrect. Uh, who knows? But when I read yeah. uh, Dreams from My Father, I got the impression that he was not that confused. Um, I mean, I certainly gauge him by his behavior. I know a lot of people would say he either is super confused or super content. Um, you know, going along with racist man, racist woman, racist child, which may be the case. Uh, but I got the impression that he was not the most confused non-white person that I had ever read or heard speak. Uh, he used the term white supremacy in his book. Um, I don't know, just from some of the things in the book, it, it gave me the impression that this was someone who had, some, in fact, he was telling a story when he was in Hawaii I don't have the book in front of me, so I'm doing this by memory. But he he was talking about when he was in Hawaii, his white grandfather would go and drink with a black male. And he was talking to this black man, I guess his grandfather's quote unquote friend. He was telling Poof, one of the worst combinations ever. But so telling in this story, right? The black friend is talking to uh, President Obama and uh, President Obama's white grandfather had fallen asleep. Right. They've drunk and he's, you know, knocked out or whatever. And the black guy is like, you see that your grandfather, he can fall asleep and not have a carry in the world. You know, not have any suspicions or concerns about me doing something to him or something happening to him. I could never fall asleep in the presence of a white person. And that is the difference between us. And I thought just that little nugget right there. That is astronomically clearer than 80% of the non-white people that I come in contact with. Yeah. Mm. Mm. I don't have to get that book. Lots of cowbells there. Woo. I don't think I can stomach it. <laughs> <laughs> she might go to the library. I so, I'll, 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 so I'll take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, I said the same thing. I really did. I was not. I was super resistant, and plus, it was a, a non-white person who was just they. They just seemed like President Obama is is the seer, is the savior. He is our hero. He is the best thing since the wheel. And you know, I was never on that. Even though I'm not, I've never been on the bashing him. I just was never caught up in all that. It's just we're in a system of white supremacy. White people apparently want him to serve their duties, what they're trying to accomplish. So you know, I was just never on all that. I didn't want to read it. Well, I remember when I read it, I thought, wow, this book it revealed so much to me about racism, white supremacy. The cap. If matter of fact, if she had just told me. The sexual dynamic is all over this book. That would have probably been enough for me to read it because it pops up so much where he's talking about his white grandparents and his white grandmother being racist and even his white grandfather calling her on this. Uh, the story about his uh, white grandfather's black friend later, uh, the Vanity Fair article that I Skype call and mail to me where he's going into detail about him dating these white females and the race thing keeps popping up and them not being able to relate and them having different views on racism and even popping up later when some of his siblings are marrying white women and the racial dynamic playing out there like the sex thing is all over the book. Uh, in addition to some other, he talks about Minister Farrakhan because they were in Chicago together. It's I just it revealed a lot about racism. I would uh, if I would I don't necessarily say buy it, but you can probably get it at the library for free, or if you can get a cheap used copy for like a dollar or what have you. If you have the time, yeah. I would say check it out. Oh, okay. To be quite honest with you, I think a person like President Obama has a interesting quote unquote advantage in the sense that he was raised and he saw white supremacy at work up close and personal and he was able to see the rationale behind or reason behind his grandparents' behavior and thought patterns. So I think he had a, in, just by what you're saying, it just sounds like he has a, um, only a person like him can actually be voted for, galvanized by white people in the United States to be president of this country. Only a specific person who has been up like who's been brought up around that dynamic can only be 
well, the only non-white person that can be, in my opinion, president of this country, representing white supremacy 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days of the year. It has to be that specific makeup of a person to, you know, take the helms as a non-white person in the U.S., I think. Especially not no, quote-unquote, descendants of slaves, quote-unquote. No way. Impossible. I, and I say impossible because of our, well, some of us, I should say, especially in this day and time, because of our genetic memory. However, what I also question is, even though he himself, Obama, was raised around that, what cultivated him to resist that or to have a different stance on racism, white supremacy? What caused him to say, you know, after dating all these, you know, slew of or white women, you know what, we, we, this is not going to work out, we don't see the eye to eye, you know, we come from different cultures, yet he was brought up in that culture. That's what I don't understand, which, what, what Udomorojo, so to speak, what kind of Udomorojo made him negate his grandparents' culture or his mother's culture, so to speak? That's that's what I would like to know. Hmm. My thought just from the book, uh, you know, my, my one shilling of a view on it would be... Uh, him realizing that he was not white. And I think not all, but I think for a considerable number of the non-white people that I have met, I would say particularly non-white males who have a white parent, the ones that I've met, the ones that I've talked to, uh, I did an interview with one and it got lost, such a tragedy. Uh, but the ones that I've met, uh, particularly who have one white parent and one black parent, as opposed to one white parent and one non-black non-white parent the former category they come to realize I might have a white parent but I am not white and it comes a point it typically comes a little later in life but there comes a point where they realize that they get that victimization they get that mistreatment they see uh, I might have that white parent but white people don't treat me like I'm white I'm a victim of racism uh, and I think for some of them, they understand that and they make the logical choices that a victim of racism should make. Um, not all the time. Uh, it def that contamination is still there. But I've seen a considerable, particularly non-white males. I think more so with the non-white females. I don't think their abuse is as great. So I don't see it as much. In fact, the pattern I've seen with non-white females tends to be that they have a great deal of animosity towards black males. Um, that's been something I've observed here in Seattle. But all that aside, that would be my quick thought on it. I think uh, he probably and I think he says as much in the book, realizing I'm not white. I think when you have that in your forefront of your mind that you're not a white person, uh, you get counter racist logic to your decisions. That will help you, uh, you know, make better, make more correct choices. Thank you. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, it's like Fight Club or White White Club. You know, first rule, <laughs> don't tell anybody about White Club. Second rule, everybody's got to be white. What was the, what was the rule again? I'm sorry. Yeah, just a little play on Fight Club. Like Fight Club, first rule of Fight Club, don't tell anybody about Fight Club. Second oh. rule of Fight Club is everyone's. Got it. Got it. Hmm. That would be an interesting one to think on um, for folks, you know, ponder on that. We can chat about it on the uh, compensatory call in. Um, I did want to make sure uh, the next chapter, I think, pretty much with the self image. I think I pretty much hit everything that I wanted to hit unless anybody else had uh, things that they wanted to touch on. Um, I was going to, uh, 
I was going to make sure, or I, I had a sound clip from uh, Ben Wattenberg, where he's talking about his book, where I think it pretty much goes in line with what Dr. Ani is saying. Uh, do folks want to hear that, or do you all want to press on to the rhetorical yeah. ethic? Let's hear it. Okay. This is uh, Ben Ben J. Wattenberg. Uh, he is uh, the author of The Birth Dearth. Uh, that's the book that Dr. Ani was quoting. As I said, he has other projects as well, uh, other books that he's written. I think more recently, uh, the book that he authored, uh, Fewer, that's the title of it, Fewer. Uh, and it's uh, the subtitle uh, for the book is how the new demographic oh, I'm <laughs> every time I get it up on the screen I click and it disappears okay how the new demographic I'm still getting caught okay how the new dem demography of depopulation will shape our future Fewer, that's the title, Fewer, and the subtitle is How the New Demography of Depopulation Will Shape Our Future. Uh, now, if you all want to check out the entire segment of this piece, it's uh, it was on C-SPAN, you know how they do book TV. Uh, it's like an hour interview, very interesting. He has charts, graphics, he has, uh, answers a few questions. Uh, I can put the link in the chat room, you all can check it out yourself. Uh, but this is real interesting. And I think it hits exactly on some of the points that Dr. Ani raises. This is from 2004, uh, Mr. Ben J. Wattenberg. So I'm going to take one more question oh, from Rob Sprinkle. Uh, yeah, Rob Sprinkle from here at the school. Uh, your graph showing uh, an American population of 409 million in, two, in 2050 is an interesting one. And uh, surely if we were that much bigger, we would be different in many ways. I found it a little curious that the, that the difference that you spoke of particularly was one suggesting that we, we would be strategically stronger. And I, well, these, well, my colleagues are asking many other very interesting questions. I was thinking about that. And I can see such an argument being made about the effect of an immigration-driven increase in population strengthening the United States from the Civil War to the Second World War, perhaps beyond. Um, the prospect presented by this increase to 400 million, though, doesn't sound like exactly the same kind of immigration. I, I was thinking to other countries that have had population increase by immigration and wondering if they felt strategically stronger. I doubt that France would feel that way now. Because they're shrinking. Well, be, I, well be, they certainly have more immigrants now than they have in the past. So. And they're immigrants and Muslims. And they're Muslims. Yeah. And they, they, the French might feel that, gee, uh, maybe Charles Martel lost the battle of 2720. Yeah. You know, maybe we got that wrong. And and certainly there's the the major example of the Roman Empire in the West from the first century to the third and particularly the fourth and the fifth, uh, where I don't think anybody would have continued to think that large-scale immigration had made Rome strategically stronger. Just the opposite. Now you may be right, but if you are right, you must have interesting reasons to explain why you think that's true. Well. I mean, I, I think that in America, by and large, assimilation has worked, uh, and, and we have uh, created a society uh, that is an America, a uniquely American society. It's uh, there's one little uh, pinpoint of data. Proportionately, the number of Latino soldiers who win Medal of Honors is higher than for any other group. So um, we do, my judgment, we do pretty well at this game we call assimilation and immigration. And uh, I mean, there's this phrase typically used uh, pejoratively called flyover country. And 
you know, when you fly over, and you saw the red state, blue state, I mean, when you fly over America, once you get 100 miles or so beyond either coast or, or, or the Gulf Coast, uh, it's pretty open country. I mean, we could go to a half a billion or 700 billion, 600 billion, whatever it is, and I don't think anybody would know the difference. I, I, you just, I, I, I don't think we'd pollute more. I mean, I think pollution is related to what people do. And we've seen every index that the EPA puts out in the last, over the last 30 years, uh, I could give you a list, but I don't have it, uh, uh, of, of, of pollution, particulate matters, CO2, all this kind of stuff has gone down, notwithstanding the fact that population has gone up. So, um, um, it, 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 it's uh, it, 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 it's something that we we could do if we want to, and we, in my judgment, and we could do it well. And because I believe, again, I'm a sort of hypernationalist, but because I believe that the United States is, to use that phrase, the last best hope of mankind on earth, whatever it is that it would be good for us and good for the world if we were even more powerful. Now, that I, I, I know that's uh, a statement that with, with which an argument can be made. So that, that much I know. But, but, but that's what I feel. Hyper nationalists heard that, heard that. Hmm? Hmm? Uh, again, the link is in the chat room. Um, if you are not in the chat room, you can uh, C-SPAN video, uh, C-SPAN video dot org. Uh, there's a hyphen, so C's hyphen span video dot org, and uh, it's him giving a talk at the University of Maryland about the book uh, Fewer: The New Demography of Depopulation. Uh, you can check it out. Uh, here he has to say uh, my quick comments on that. Number one, uh, when he talks about uh, we have got a good record of integration. Very interesting. We've been in my view. That is we white people have done a very good job contaminating non-white people who come to this area of the world so that they will think like racist man, racist woman, racist child. Second, his example of this was, quote unquote, Latinos uh, being rewarded for their service in the armed forces. And I thought that is extremely telling our the way that we can evidence that we are successful at, quote unquote, uh, assimilating non-white people is by their willingness to kill and die for the maintenance expansion of racism, white supremacy. Very telling, in my view, and his final statement about him being a hyper nationalist. I think you can just you can go to Dr. Ani's glossary to see what she defines as a nationalist. I'll just I'll leave it there. But very telling clip. You can uh, you know, you can check out the full hour and see what he has to say and some of the questions that the white people in the audience ask him uh, during this talk. It's about an hour and I don't know, a little over an hour. Check it out on C-SPAN. Um See any thoughts before we proceed? Chapter uh, six, rhetorical ethic, which again I thought was a phenomenal chapter, very important. If you got to do any cheating with this book, which I would not encourage, definitely do not cheat on chapter six. Make sure you read it carefully. Extremely important. But any thoughts on the clip? Or are we moving forward? I just think that, as you mentioned, that in this day and age, it seems like. The terrorism tactics are going to increase. If he's saying super national, what well, he said, super national, what again? <laughs> I think he was saying he's a he's a super nationalist, hyper nationalist with regards to thinking that this area. He was talking about the United States that we should be more powerful. Uh, they, excuse me, they should be more powerful, and that would enable them to uh, help other non-white people around the world if they were more powerful. I, I, I interpret that as the refinement game is going to subside 
and the aggressiveness of white supremacy tactics are going to increase tremendously in years to come. I concur. Unfortunately, that'll be the broadcast this Sunday. That's what we'll be talking about. I would unfortunately anticipate uh, white people taking off the gloves. Uh, and as I said, I don't I don't believe it's just a part of the Asili. White people don't really like to hide their terrorism. They really enjoy gloating over their victims uh, that they have stomped on. They I mean, that is an integral aspect, I think, of the Asili. Uh, they really enjoy uh, putting it in your face that, yeah, we're dominant, you're helpless and pitiful and dependent on us. We've totally abused and terrorized you all. They really enjoy that aspect. And I think they are looking forward to getting back to that. Everything that I've been seeing this year, that's what it looks like. They are just, you know, they're tired of hiding uh, their racism. They want to be more upfront about it. Yeah, I am. Um I, I used to attend a, a school in New York called the Ethical Culture School um, with lots of white people. Um, and and these white kids, they play this game called Risk a lot. I've been, like, over the all the, like, white boys play Risk. Risk is a game of global conquest. They put little, little, uh, little, um, little, uh, you know, little little um, uh, troops on on the countries and all the different territories, and they'll, they're trying to conquer. They love this game. You know, it's like they're being yeah. We're going backwards. There's another game. There's another game called Trajan, or I think that's the correct uh, pronunciation. It's spelled T R A J A N, and it pretty much has the same concept as what you're talking about in Brooklyn. All areas of people activity, any way that white people invest their time, they make sure that they never lose sight of their primary objective, their primary expenditure of time, energy, currency, their life force should be about the continuance of white terrorism worldwide. Their games reflect that. Their quote unquote leisure activity reflects that pool. Dr. Welsing. Uh, baseball she broke that down a game that I do play I don't play that often but I at least get like a game or two in a week because it doesn't take very long uh, it's called Settlers even the name of it Settlers um, <laughs> some non white people informed me about this game and they got it from being around white people what you do in the game is you pick spots on a board and there are different resources uh, like wood there's timber uh, clay sheep uh, different resources and you try to pick the best spot to get the best resources and you're just trying to colonize you're trying to beat everybody and colonize faster than everybody else and they have a robber which is an integral aspect of the game right and you don't have any characters I want to be clear about that there are no people there's nothing that is symbolic of a person in the entire game except the robber piece the robber piece is and it doesn't, I mean, it's the closest thing to a person. It, if you had to pick anything, if you looked at it, you say, okay, I see how this could be a person. Uh, and when you get cards to get the robber, it, there is a picture of a person. There's a picture of a soldier on it. What you do with the robber is you pick it up and you plop that on a spot on the board. When you get the robber or when you roll a seven, you put that down on the resource and it blocks that resource. So if somebody's number comes up and bam, they would get, you know, timber. If the robber's there, they don't get it. The robber can really mess you up. If you all want to take a guess, since we talked about the image of the other, as to what color the robber is, any guesses? Uh -oh. Black. Of course, of course. <laughs> There's an image online uh, because everybody, the people that introduced me to this game, they understand racism, white supremacy. So we all, you know, saw this immediately. There's an image online where white people have taken the robber in this game and put an afro on it and a bucket of KFC chicken. Oh. Trifling, tacky, terroristic. Doesn't get any better than tacky. Moving forward. Um, 
chapter six, which I thought was just the whole book is phenomenal. I, mean, I don't want to act like the rest of the book is just foolishness. The whole book is phenomenal, but I really, really enjoyed chapter six. It reminded me of why I have said so many times this book more than any other book. And that's not disparaging anybody else's work. Just uh, I really, you know, was not focused and I really didn't have a correct understanding about white people until I read this book. And reading chapter six reminded me of what an earth shattering impact this book had on me and why I would say this book more than any other book is responsible for the cows being in existence. Um, she starts chapter six, the quotes. My, my man, Arma, I would love to get him on the program. He's still alive. He's uh in Ghana, I believe. I'll uh, have to see if we can work on that. But uh, yeah, she starts off with Arma. In us has been the need to spend life cutting through deceiving superficialities to reach again the essential truths the destroyers must hide from spirits in their white, if their white road is to prevail. His next quote is, dishonest words are the food of rotten spirits. Hmm. The final quote to kick off this chapter, again, it's rhetoric and behavior. Watergate is no mere accident of history. It is the natural consequence of a government faced with the problem of trying to preserve the facade of democracy before its citizens while waging imperialistic war abroad, plundering the public treasury at home and supporting reaction wherever it can be found. To maintain the myth of American righteousness, the government has no other recourse except to lie. Indeed, lying becomes the central political behavior of the state. And this is William Strickland. Phenomenal kick off to an exemplary chapter. Uh, this is on uh, 313. Uh, I will go uh, 313 to... <laughs> I think I'll just read a little bit on three. I'm just going to read the one paragraph on 313 and then skip to 315 and go to 316 so folks will know the the reading order so 313 bottom of the page second to last paragraph this is a common misconception that has led to a mistaken view and a superficial understanding of the nature of european society white people to refer to the images offered above as ideal is a misuse or at least a misleading use of the term ideal. The projection and success of the image of the committed altruistic doctor. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, I need to I need to give you her example of the doctor because I thought that was great. I was trying to just read her part of it. I'll give you the so you'll have the proper context. So uh, she's talking about how they promote the idea of the doctor being this benevolent figure uh, and she says for example an idealized belief long cherished in America is that all doctors are selfless friendly people who choose medicine as their profession because they felt themselves called to serve humanity and who have little interest in either the money or the prestige of their position of course many physicians do not measure up to this ideal nevertheless the continued success of television programs that portray the average American doctor as a paragon of virtue indicates how deeply rooted in our collective psyche the ideal of the noble physician is. Mm -hmm. Now we get Dr. Ani. This is a common misconception that has led to a mistaken view and superficial understanding of the nature of European society, white people. To refer to the image offered as ideal is a misuse or at least a misleading use of the term ideal. The projection and success of the image of the committed altruistic doctor do not indicate that it is a deeply rooted ideal in the American psyche. It is rather an indication of the fact that this is how Americans want to appear to others, most often to non-European peoples, their objects. 
In this case, it is the way that the doctor wants to appear to his patients or objects because this appearance works to his advantage. On the other hand, an image that projects him as a potential exploiter can lead to the possibility of malpractice suits and to the institutionalization of socialized medicine and neither of which is lucrative for him. Moving to 315, top of the page, rhetorical ethic. Whoa! A rhetorical ethic is not a deep-lying assumption. It is a superficial verbal expression that is not intended for assimilation by the members of the culture that produced it. I'll read that again just to make sure everybody is clear. A rhetorical ethic is not a deep lying assumption. It is a superficial verbal expression that is not intended for assimilation by the members of the culture that produced it. The rhetorical ethic a European phenomenon has been neglected in conventional ethnological theory, which has consistently offered concepts devoid of political significance. Anthropologists talk about the gap in all cultures between thought and deed, between ideas and actions. This gap to which I am referring, however, is between verbal expression and belief or commitment between what people say and what they do. Nowhere other than in European culture do words mean so little as indices of belief. It is this characteristic that is of concern here and this characteristic for which the concepts of traditional anthropology are inadequate to explain. As a cultural trait it has, however, been described by others particularly those who have been made victims of European cunning. Below, an indigenous American describes European behavior. They would make slaves of us if they could, but as they cannot, they kill us. There is no faith to be placed in their words. They will say to an Indian, my friend, my brother. They will take him by the hand and at the same moment destroy him. Remember that this day I warned you to be to beware of such friends as these. I know the long knives. They are not to be trusted. It is an inherent characteristic of the culture that it prepares members of the culture to be able to act like friends towards those they regard as enemies. To be able to convince others that they have come to help them when they in fact have come to destroy the others and their culture. That some may believe that they are actually doing good only makes them more dangerous for they have swallowed their own rhetoric. Perhaps a convenient self-delusion. Hypocritical behavior is sanctioned and rewarded in European culture. The rhetorical ethic helps to sanction it. European culture cannot be understood in terms of the dynamics of other cultures alone. It is a culture that breeds hypocrisy in which hypocrisy is a supportive theme, a standard of behavior. Last segment I'll read and then we'll see if any folks have comments. I'll give out the number again in case uh, folks want to dial in. It is 760-569-7676 and the code is 564-943-POUND. Uh, the entire time that I was reading, reading this section, Timothy Wise just kept flashing across my mind. Uh, in my view, the so-called white anti-racists these are the vanguard of the current rhetorical ethic of racist man, racist woman, uh, getting non-white people to believe that there are some white people who are not racist when racism, white supremacy is a core aspect of what it means to be a white person. On 316, top of the page. The distinction and definitions that can lead to a better understanding of the Europeans and their culture can only come from a perspective that is not one of European chauvinism. 
for it is the method of European chauvinism or cultural nationalism to conceal European interests. As I use it, value is only meaningful value. It is that which motivates behavior and is the origin of human commitment. Value determines what is imitated and preserved, what is selected for and encouraged. Avowed values, on the other hand, which are merely professed, which find expression only verbally, which are not indicative of behavior, belong to what I have called the rhetorical ethic. The European rhetorical ethic is precisely that, purely rhetorical and as such has its own origins as a creation for export, i.e. for the political, intercultural activity of the European. It is designed to create an image that will prevent others from successfully anticipating European behavior and its objective is to encourage non-strategic, i.e. naive, rather than successful political behavior on the part of others. This is the same as non-political behavior. It is designed to sell, to dupe, to promote European nationalist objectives. It packages European cultural imperialism in a wrapping that makes it appear more attractive, less harmful. None of these features represents what can culturally be referred to as an ideal in any sense. The rhetorical ethic is, therefore, not dysfunctional in European culture. It does not generate nor reflect conflict in European ideology or belief system, but it is rather necessary to the maintenance and projection of the Udomorojo and performs a vital function in sustaining European cultural nationalism in the pursuit of its international objectives. The rhetorical ethic is made possible by the fact that hypocrisy as a mode of behavior is a valued theme in European life. The same hypocritical behavior that, it, that its presence sanctions. Again, value refers to that which is encouraged and approved in a culture. European culture is constructed in such a way that successful survival within it discourages honesty and directness and encourages dishonesty and deceit. The ability to appear to be something other than what one is, to hide one's self, one's motives and intent. People who are duped by others and relate to a projected image are considered fools or country bumpkins. Hypocrisy in this way becomes not a negative personality trait, not an immoral or abnormal behavior, but is both expected and cultivated. It is considered to be a crucial ingredient of sophistication, a European goal. European intracultural political behavior is based on hypocrisy, as are business relations, the advertising media, and most other areas of public and social interaction. It is merely a manifestation of this theme when Americans, white people, claim that politicians are basically honest. The claim itself is hypocritical, and the public expects it to be so. We all know that the objective of commercial advertising is to convince us to buy products so that manufacturers can make large profits. But the slogans attempt to persuade us that the product is beneficial to our well-being, as though the producer has our welfare at heart. This hypocrisy touches the lives of every member of the culture in their dealings with one another, and yet it originates, in part, in the nature of their intra intercultural relationships. It is a part of the mechanism of European expansionism. All of these factors must go into the understanding of the rhetorical ethic and not an overly simplistic distinction between ideal and actual culture. Perhaps a relevant distinction with regard to other cultures that create and are created by very different cultural personalities. I will stop there.
uh, this was on 317, what I was reading actually from 316 to 317. I think, as I said, extremely important to understand white people. They are very good at projecting one image as though they are about brotherhood and justice and equality while they know good and well that they are committed to the practice of white supremacy forever. Just got to make sure that non-white people don't understand that so that non-white people think that Timothy Wise and any of these other white people, Jane Elliott, Dr. Peggy McIntosh, you name as many as you want, to think John Brown, that these folks are in can change, are going to change, are going to stop practicing racism and nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, any of the folks on the line have any comments? I'll also check to see if we have uh, any hands as well. Uh, the folks on the line, uh, Skype caller, Brooklyn caller, and uh, the female caller, your line is open. Malik B. Wise, your line is open as well. Well, basically, it's, it's like everything that they do is built on a lie, you know, like from, you know, Christianity saying turn the other cheek, you know, and like they came to like Africa and gave them the Bible and then, you know, they left with the land. Well, they have the land now, so that's how they do what they do because they they they're able to lie and convince people that they're they really have this goodness and brotherhood about them, and it sounds good, and, but in reality, it's not the case. But somehow, we kind of believe it. I think that's where the religion comes in. It kind of weakens us and kind of get our defenses down and stuff. So they kind of go hand in hand. And that's just my opinion on it. Can I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Um, my code word for white people for a long time has been the following term, the persuasions, you know, Caucasian persuasion. So when I'm in public and I'm talking about them and like to my friends or something, I call I use the term persuasions. Um, another example that comes to mind when you read that passage on three sixteen and three seventeen is the old saying, which I don't hear anymore, is like the little white lie or oh don't worry about it. It's just a little white lie. It's not gonna hurt no oh, one. Oh yeah. I don't yeah. know if that terminology is still being used today, but when I was growing up in the eighties that was Mm -hmm. In heavy rotation. Um, in the page 3316, uh, the very top half of the paragraph, um, that made me think of this, this push that white supremacy is doing right now in terms of forcing this homosexual lifestyle upon people in general, especially non-white people. And I think that's another rhetorical ethic tactic that is currently be at play right now. So that came to mind as well. Um, and yeah, that's about it for now. What do you mean when you say you think the uh, so-called gay rights and or uh, homosexual push is another part of the rhetorical ethic? Let me go back to that paragraph you were reading. Ah, uh, when you go to talking about it meaning the European rhetorical ethic is designed to create an image that will prevent others from successfully anticipating European behavior or its objective is to encourage non-strategic, i.e. naive, rather than, uh, rather than successful political behavior on the part of others. It is designed to sell, to dupe, to promote European nationalistic objectives. It is packaged European culture imperialism, imperialism in a wrapping that makes it appear more attractive than less harmful. I, for some reason, this homosexual lifestyle popped up into play in the sense of, in the sense of it being used as one of an objective, which is linked in with the previous clip you play dealing with depopulation. And the uh, hyper-nationalistic term that the uh, the white guy used in his um, in that uh, C-SPAN clip. So I'm just it just I just see how it interlocks. So 
Some people may not see it, but I do. How it interlocks with their hidden imperialistic objective under the system of white supremacy. And how they're making and spinning, well, how they, okay, for example, the way they are right now currently the system is slowly putting quote-unquote value on homosexual lifestyle is through the media, the media um, actors or actress, actresses who are portrayed as loving couples, starting a family, et cetera, et cetera. They're, win they're winning awards. Um, if you are heterosexual and you, you, know, you talk out of line or talk negative, negatively about homosexual lifestyle in a t on TV or in the media, you're quickly, you know, bashed. So in a sense, homosexuality lifestyle is, is slowly becoming quote unquote value, which is a uh, is created to you know hit to create a like a hidden you know facade masking their true objective, which is to destroy the concept of family. Because with the concept of family, you don't have various nations from various cultures. So that also ties into the whole depopulation thing going on as well and the further capturing of natural resources that are not found in white people countries or land. That's all for now. I got a question for so do you, do you mean like do I see what you're saying is like I, I kind of it's interesting um the way the Neely Fuller definition of a uh, yeah, I just see the sense in calling so-called homosexual like I, I see I think it's more accurate to say antisexual because from what I know about sex it 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 produces life you know so then like if it doesn't produce life, it can't really be called sex. So then, like, you know, antisexual makes more sense. So then, uh, just using words to obscure truth rather than to, to, uh, to, to discuss it or to, you know, uh, make it available for people to, you know, to see. Is that something like what you're saying? It's kind of like that, but I guess another way to say it is that I see the whole homosexuality lifestyle being pushed forth, one, as a political um, football. Therefore, if it's, if it's being used as a political football, it is covering the true objective, which is to destroy, in my opinion, which is to destroy... So further productivity of trying to sustain a family in this day and age, whatever, you know, a family in the sense of between a man and a woman and bearing children together willingly and raising them and rearing them the best you can as, as a unit. I see that makes sense. Yeah. For whatever reason, just that passage alone made me think of, you know, homosexual as a political football game being used right now. I, for whatever reason, it just pops in my head over and over again. And I, and I was questioning myself. I wonder if it's being used in that manner. I, I, I don't know because I'm not one of the members who sit at the seat of power, so... Well, it's like, what are people not talking about? You know, like, I mean, if people are talking about things that are, like, just not pivotal at all, and they are at least kind of destructive, it's not extremely destructive, so then it's like, if they're talking about these really superficial, somewhat destructive things, then what are they not talking about? And then you realize how many massive, glaring problems we have that we could deal with if we weren't busy talking about things that are just pointless. So, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. The, the rhetoric is just covering up 
the uh, the, the glaring problem of racism, white supremacy. I mean, like, we're not we're not we're not trying to get bogged down in the, in the rhetoric here, you know. So, yeah, we're talking about white supremacy. Right. Even like the rhetoric that like politicians use in camp in like in the campaign trails, you know. That's an example. I mean, they say one thing, but they're sticking to the uh, main objective, which is to maintain and further expand the system of white supremacy in any given European country. Excellent observation, uh, Malik B. Wise. I know your line is open. Any of the other callers, do y'all have any input? Can I be heard? Volume is a little low. If you could speak up. How about now? Is that better? Uh, a little better. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, you know, uh, get in that. Uh, you know, reading that section on hypocrisy just, you know, demonstrated to, to well, I kind of, always kind of knew it, but it just like made it super clear the contradiction, you know, of calling, you know, this country a Christian country, and then you, and then you look at its policies, what they do, and you realize that, you know, it's all... It's all, it's all lies, you know what I'm saying? And, and, it's, and it's put there for a reason, you know, to just confuse people. And uh, the way she uh, explains it and talks about it, it's like, it's been like, open eyes to it. I never looked at it that way. Yeah, I mean, even even white people calling themselves Americans. I mean, that that that's rhetoric. I mean, mm-hmm. yes, yeah. <laughs> or or you know, saying oh, disadvantaged groups. Like I mean, like gay people. I mean, so-called gay people have never you know been lynched and you know burned and uh, in- enslaved and on the behalf of non you know, anti-sexual people, and, and then, you know, not like all the men in the world have ever, you know, enslaved females, but like linking it all together and saying, oh, the disadvantaged or certain groups, they never get specific, they say groups, but it's... And another example of the rhetoric, rhetoric would be the French slogan of fraternité, égalité, and liberté. They grant that over and over again, but everyone knows that's rhetoric as well. What does that mean? Like, in essence, it's saying like brotherhood, uh, liberty, equality for all Frenchmen, that whole French oh. deal. Oh, okay. Yeah. I guess maybe the pre- uh, Pledge of Allegiance would that be considered rhetoric? Uh, I would say so. Yeah, and they make all of the. Well, I don't know if they do it nowadays like they used to in schools. Make the kids. Children say it. Uh, 
Uh, Brooklyn caller, if you can mute your line when you're not speaking, uh, just to cut down on the background noise, uh, just mute when you're not speaking, that would be helpful. Oh, sorry. Um, I I don't know if this was discussed uh, already, but I was very, uh, I I shouldn't say surprised, but I, I was. Um, kind of surprised at, at all these um, these uh, prominent uh, thinkers and, um, and poets that she quoted in the uh, on page uh, 298 and 299. And these are some of the people whom uh, I've read some of their books, and I, and I, I didn't think, and I never knew that they thought about you know black people that way. And it just like really like really made me like how like entrenched and deep the racism is you know and it was it was like an eye opener for me i don't know if you guys had the same kind of uh uh, uh you guys came to the same conclusion as i did the first oh, time around. Just, uh, it was oh go ahead i'm sorry go ahead Okay, um, I, I just saw, I was watching it, th- randomly, I, ra- I was watching a random documentary yesterday, and it mentioned that guy Toynbee, which I, I'd never seen the guy's name before, but um, it was talking about this guy Toynbee talking about some kind of solution where they would go to, go to, like, 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 reanimate dead bodies on Jupiter, or something, having it I don't know. It was, it was kind of strange, but it was kind of interesting. But uh, yeah, just I guess all these all these historical figures, they all. I guess the, the people like to say, "Oh, everybody was racist back back then." Oh yeah. <laughs> but this rhetoric. That's it. The uh, book. Because I had mentioned it before, um, where a white this is a white person who's doing the literary breakdown of Edgar Allan Poe, and you know how this is this is all racism that's just being coded. Uh, the book is titled Miscegenation, of course, and the author is Elise Lemire, uh, and it's L E M I R E Elise Lemire, uh, and it's titled Miscegenation. This is a short book. Anybody, if you don't like reading, you know, wordy texts that are full of white jargon and $20 words, uh, this would be one I would recommend. It's short to the point. I don't think it's even 200 pages. And uh, it, I thought it had a lot of great info. She talks about uh, Thomas Jefferson, Sally Hemings, Edgar Allan Poe is in there. Uh, I think she comes more contemporary as well. But uh, yeah, I thought it was a lot of helpful info. What's her last name? Lemire. Hope I'm saying it correctly. Uh, L. E M I R E Elise Lemire, oh. okay. and the book is titled Miscegenation. Okay. I got a quick question uh, for you, Gus. On page 288, she, uh, I remember I knew she was quoting uh, this uh, this guy, this European guy from uh, uh, South Africa, P.W. Bota, and and I think he, uh, on the fourth paragraph of his, uh, you know, speech or whatever, said that it is our it is our strong conviction that the black is the raw material for the white man. What do you think he meant by that? I, I, I wasn't, uh, I didn't understand that sentence. So I think that what he was trying to get at. Uh, can you give me the page number again, please? Oh, it's 288. 288, okay. Okay. Like uh, Paragraph of the strong conviction 
Oh, okay. Uh, I think that uh, meaning that black people are supposed to be used. Uh, we don't necessarily want to kill them. We want to keep them around. They can be used to dig our minds or uh, any any tasks, laborious objectives that we don't necessarily want to accomplish. They can be used for those objectives, but we need to be in domination uh, the same way that non-white or excuse me, the same way that white people in this area of the world will use so-called uh, immigrants, uh, so-called Latinos will use them. Any of the uh, tasks, work that they don't want to do, we can just use these non-white people to get that done. Uh, I think that's what he means when he says raw material uh, in that passage. I could be incorrect, but I think based on my knowledge of P.W. Potha and the way they got down to South Africa, I think that's what he means. We're just going to use them uh, to do, you know, our little me the help, basically. Um I actually had a, a quote. This is a fabulous documentary. I've recommended before. I don't think I've mentioned it in a while, but it's Witness to Apartheid. Uh, it got nominated for an Academy Award, surprisingly. It came out in uh, 1984, and some white people went into South Africa. This is when they had like the real brutal in your face white supremacy, and they were just videotaping what was happening to black people. They were being terrorized, black people. And uh, P.W. Botha, uh, I believe it's either his wife. Or his daughter, I think it's his wife, uh, P.W. Botha, a uh, racist white supremacist. His wife is just making it plain. Like, I mean, this clip will give you an idea of how explicit the racism white supremacy was in that area of the world at this time. And it might even make that passage a little clearer uh, what the white people were all about. But this is a segment from Witness to Apartheid. And this is uh, Mrs. Botha giving her view. What? And so do I feel, as a white person, uh, we have survived as uh, pure whites for many years. And I think that we also have the right to keep on surviving as white for the next two, three, four hundred years. So I don't see why we, we should be, um, um, we should disappear, because that's what's going to happen. The, the white population in South Africa will totally disappear if um, this new compensation of um, of Pierre Bota comes through. You know, we will just disappear. We will all become um, chocolate color. Now, in South Africa, we're not fighting the whites. We're fighting the evil system. We're fighting injustice. Now, remove injustice, then you'll have peace. You cannot have it otherwise. With injustice, you have no peace. It's impossible. Anyone who wants peace must fight for, fight for justice. Now, we are fighting for justice. Now, the nationalists think they, could, they can have peace and quiet with injustice. It's impossible. They can't have it. You know, I think they are so confused by um, communist inspiring that um, they think we are doing them out on something. You know, we're doing them in, uh, if that's the way I have to put it. They're losing out on something. Uh, they always see a specter behind every protest. And uh, I just wonder whether one needs uh, an agitator to feel hungry. Uh, I do not imagine that I need an agitator uh, to protest against low wages. We do not have to tell children to throw stones. The children's reaction is an attitude, is a response to injustice. Injustice in the classroom, injustice in the educational system, injustice in society. They live in slums. They have nothing to eat. Their parents have no money. Some have no houses. But I can just see that if they carry on like that and, you know, it's getting out of hand, that uh, the army will just be called in and there will there'll be one big wipe out. And I myself feel the only way to stop this is to have one big wipe out like we had in Charcoal. 
I think if the state president is put into a checkmate position where he really has to do something when it gets totally out of hand, I have no doubts about it that he'll call the army in and there'll be a wipeout as far as I'm concerned. Even though he talks, you know, the language America wants him to talk and he's moving into that direction, I still believe that deep down he is a boor. And um, uh, deep down when it comes to the point where the whites will be wiped out because of violence or whatever, I really think that he will call in the army and you'll, you'll see that it has, that it has survived. It's not possible to fight for liberation without inconveniences. We're bound to run into that, and some of us have been detained, and some are killed uh, because they're fighting for liberation. And by liberation, we mean a complete change, uh, not just, uh, you know, uh, trying to camouflage uh, or trying to uh, apply icing sugar on a rotten cake. We, we need a complete change, a change of heart. In fact, we need a transformation, a complete transformation, a new person and a new society. Man. Uh, that documentary is phenomenal. I would encourage folks to check it out. It is a little difficult to find. Uh, if you go to a major college, university, they'll probably have it. Um, it is, I cannot recommend it enough. Uh, and I would say that is evidence. It's what I'm on my job, uh, just studying, reading, watching material. Wow. I didn't even, I didn't listen to that clip beforehand to get all of the information because I'd heard it before and I'd seen it and I knew what the white woman was going to say but wow that is everything we've been talking about from the white woman she even knows she's telling you this is rhetorical ethic now that white president P.W. Botha he might get out there and say what the white people in America want him to say we're going to be quote unquote fair and we're going to be equal but when it comes down to the come down he is going to send out the military and we will wipe those niggas out. She just said it. that's exactly what we've been talking about. They know this. White people understand that they normally are just not that explicit in letting you know. We might have a lot of sugary words, but when it comes down to the come down, whatever. We will terrorize any number of you all, babies, children, pregnant women, whatever. White domination forever. The second part, the non-white person who was speaking, oh my lord, that is exactly why the definition is a global system of people. I was seeing that consistently and Dr. Ani, she's talking about that repeatedly. Our inability to grasp what it means to be a white person. He's saying, oh no, no, we're not fighting white people, we're fighting injustice. The injustice is white people. That problem right there is why we have not made progress. He's saying we need a fundamental change, a change of heart. That is not possible. Dr. Ani says that in the book, white people would have to totally change the Asili, their DNA, if you will, to no longer be racist. And that's not going to happen. Uh, and we just have not been able to grasp that that's why South Africa is still having the same problem racism white supremacy even though they don't have formal apartheid anymore that's why we don't have Jim Crow anymore formally but we still got the same problem with Trayvon Martin and a pregnant black woman a pregnant black female excuse me who was tasered just a couple days ago in Chicago same problem I'll mute my line we have about 20 minutes left so if you think you want to comment you should get your hand up now or what have you I'll mute my line see if anybody else has anything to share no comment I just want to get in that um, I don't know anything that happened in South Africa because you know I wasn't born in this country I came here at a very young age and uh, came here, like, towards the mid-'90s. So um, thanks for mentioning that documentary. I will check it out so I can, you know, further inform myself on uh, uh, the whole apartheid thing. So <coughs> thank you, Beth. Uh, 
I have a quick um, something here on page uh, three eighteen. There's like in the middle of the page, it's saying uh, as the uh, Christian ethic, universal love, brotherhood, peace, that meek shall inherit inherit the earth, turn the other cheek, love. Thy neighbor, once officially recognized by the state, was not designed for the assimilation of the moral guidance of Europeans. So all that stuff is for us. So they can take, you know, so they can maintain their their their, their white supremacist uh, system. Because you know we believe that a lot of us do. Just like like he said, you know, oh no, it's not, it's not white. It's uh. No, we want justice. You know, it's not color, and uh, but I think you know it comes from that, that Christianity again. It does a job on us. So that's just all I have to say. Mm. Yep. Yep. This is uh, I had made notes on that page as well. Three eighteen to three nineteen. Yeah. Lord. Um, where she says, uh, to recapitulate briefly, the Christian statement that religion should be universal said that was going to be a key theme in the book, thereby discrediting other religions that were obviously and avowedly culture bound. It claimed, in fact, to be the properly universalistic religion, giving European conquerors the moral justification they needed to turn their politically aggressive actions into seemingly altruistic ones. But what is most important here is that the Christian ideology pronounced as virtuous those very modes of behavior that immobilize... Uh, let's see. But what is most important here is that the Christian ideology pronounced as virtuous those very modes of behavior that immobilize a culture politically renders its members susceptible to European control and less able to resist the pursuit of peace, the love of one's enemy, which concretely implies the betrayal of oneself. Woo. I'll read that one more time. The pursuit of peace, the love of one's enemy, which concretely implies the betrayal of oneself, the brotherhood of man, an abstraction that concretely manifests, it manifests itself as the denial of one's culture and therefore one's ideology and commitment. All of these elements combine to form the ideal psychocultural counterpart to political subjugation. And it succeeded in doing the job that it was culturally designed to do. It did not affect the overwhelming historical pattern of European behavior, which is characterized by antithetical tendencies to those mentioned above. The growth of the empire was not impeded by passivity and love. Rather, it thrived on the intensely aggressive and hostile behavior that the Asili of the culture encouraged. European theorists have invariably failed to interpret correctly this function of the Christian ethic. In its European context, a failure that has been endemic to Western social theory, whether representative of the right or the left, whether avowedly nationalistic or critical. Uh, that's 318 to 319. Uh, and just quickly, this is on page 321, top paragraph 321. Um, just reading a short section. Uh, the fact is that the overwhelming majority of Europeans, white people, automatically, not necessarily reflectively, but naturally understand how to use the rhetorical ethic because of their mutual participation in a common Udomorojo. The ideology and collective personality that they share. The isolated instances of those who do not identify with this Udomorojo energy source properly or totally, and those who become be confused by the rhetorical ethic, have encouraged the illusion that it represents conflict in European ideology. I thought that was a real important couple sentences. I'll even read that one more time just to make sure we're all clear. 
Uh, she says the fact that the overwhelming majority of Europeans, white people, automatically, not necessarily reflectively, but naturally understand how to use this ethic because of their mutual participation in a common Udomorojo. The ideology and collective personality that they share. The isolated instances of those who do not identify with this Udomorojo properly or totally and those who become confused by the rhetorical ethic have encouraged the illusion that it represents a conflict in European ideology. Uh, I take that to mean when you see a white person and in my view, I don't really think they're white. I couldn't put my finger on someone who would qualify as being confused about what it means to be a white person and what they're supposed to be about. But just for sake of argument, saying such a person does exist, that further helps white people because non-white people will see that and think, oh, see, there are some white people who are trying to figure it out. It only further works to support what she's calling the rhetorical ethic as though hey there's a problem here we shouldn't be doing this we're supposed to be about justice and equality and that is not true at all white people know what they're about as she says they don't even have to reflect on it it is natural it is instinctive they don't have to sit down and study how they're going to be racist terroristic it is in their DNA. Everything about the Asili, the Udomorojo, and the Udomowazo is going to direct them to being terroristic towards non-white people, others, especially black people. Yeah, I, I found that, it, that uh, I, I definitely, that one pop, popped out to me too, um, where she says that it's natural, but not necessarily reflective. Um, can I read a little section that um, kind of like piggybacks with that one on 332? Sure. Um, also has, it kind of has this smacks of Tim Wise a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. 332, the, the last that paragraph, um, the confused liberal becomes the most dangerous European uh, chauvinist of all. His wearing of two hats, quote-unquote, does more to maintain the European system than the work of those who are recognized as chauvinists. If a missionary sincerely believes that he has come to help Africans, then this can only be regarded as a dangerous form of delusion. <laughs> the politically wise attitude of his victims would be to regard him as exactly as they would any other would-be conqueror. Unfortunately for them, in the past, First world peoples who have understood the implications of European missionizing, whether of the secular or the religious variety, have expended great energy in the attempt to convince the missionary of the real cultural, political effect of his work. This is a hopeless cause. Thus, such efforts only involve them in the endless rhetorical abyss of European culture instead of an active self defense. The point here is that although the rhetorical ethic may sometimes represent instances of self-deception within European culture itself, this does not alter the fact of its function and effectiveness with regard to Western imperialism. The only way to help first world peoples, non-white peoples, is to accurately represent the nature of European culture and the motives of European behavior. The decision as to what changes are to be made in our cultures, are ours and must be initiated by us. And then he uh, quotes, she quotes Francis Welsing, Press Welsing. Um, people of color have not understood where white people were coming from from day one. Right now, black people keep assuming that what they feel about other people, white people also feel. Non-white people all over the world are baffled by how easily white people move into hypocrisy and deceit. We just have not been able to fathom it. If you are operating on one logic system and you encounter somebody who is coming from a completely different logic system, you may not be able to figure it out, especially if they are really fine in their methodology of deceit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Hi, uh, may I uh, say something? 
Uh, it's kind of like that yeah, old uh, cliche, a cliche uh, wolf in sheep's clothes, basically. You know, that's that's the way they are. You have to keep that in mind. Is it cheat mode? No, no, a wolf in sheep's clothes. That's who, that's how they are with their uh, rhetoric, you know. They come on um, nice and sweet like a, a sheep, but actually they're a wolf, you know, going to devour you and chew you up and have you for lunch. You understand? Yeah, the you old saying, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the old saying, uh, wolf in sheep clothing, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's what I thought of when he, he was reading that. It made me think of that. Can I say something? Um, when you were reading that also, I thought of the, uh, the the behavior of European Jews. Sometimes they like to point out how, wait, 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 I'm not white, I'm Jewish. Or the woman, and they benefit from the system of white supremacy and everything, you know, Hunky dory, so to speak. Then it was like, oh no, 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 I'm Jewish. I'm Jewish. You know, I, I struggle too. My people struggle too. So I see yeah. that kind of behavior as um, rhetoric as well. <laughs> they wear two hats. Yes, they wear two hats. Yep. <laughs> yes. Mhm. I've noted that in a couple of. Uh, document or just different works when people get serious uh, about talking about the problem with white people uh, Dr. Francis Cresswell's name tends to pop up frequently um, I've seen that a couple times not that Dr. Ani wasn't serious but I thought she was really driving the point home bang great quote from Dr. Wellsing Hello? Hello? Yes. 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 Yeah, we're having a tough I'm right here. <laughs> I was. Uh, I didn't know if anybody else uh, had a thought. Um, this is on three twenty six, three twenty seven. Uh, we got about a little less than ten minutes left in the program. Uh, if anybody has thoughts, comments, questions, they want to get in. This is on three twenty six and three twenty seven. And someone did post links for witness to apartheid in the uh, uh, in the chat room. That was uh, me. Oh, right on. Right on. Thank you kindly. Excellent documentary. I would encourage folks to uh, check it out. A lot of great info on just the explicit nature of white terrorism uh, in the area of the world known as South Africa. Um, this is 326, 327, same chapter, rhetorical ethic, excuse me, rhetoric and behavior. Uh, bottom of 326. White supremacy is characteristic of European culture, not exceptional or aberrant. And Nazism is the manifestation of the extreme possibilities of these tendencies when the control mechanisms of the culture fail. That is, when the destructive tendencies are unleashed among Europeans. Robin Williams, on the other hand, struggles to demonstrate the logical inconsistency of racial determinism with Western ideals. The strategy is simple. By verbally disavowing white nationalism, the practice of white supremacy, Europeans and European Americans are thereby able to avoid dealing with it. They cannot confront it because intuitively they know what they would never admit, that it is an inherent part of their cultural heritage. They are committed to their culture and therefore indirectly to white nationalism to eradicate white supremacist ideology from the institutionalization of their culture would imply radically changing themselves and what it means to be European white it would imply a different a sealy a different bio cultural being very important segment as well in my view 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How, how about this? Uh, on three twenty nine. Um, continues with that uh, thought. Um, the, the trick is to claim ideas that have failed to influence the definition of the culture because they do not fit in with the asili. In this way, any critique of European ideology informed by a vision of the human that could only have been created either by a rejection of European value or in a culture qualitatively different from European culture itself becomes a Western quote-unquote product. And And this argument, if argued at all, is made on the basis of values that were, for the European, never more than rhetoric. Quote, unquote, Christian mysticism becomes Western, and the, quote, unquote, enlightenment, enlightenment's vision of a happy world is not tarnished by the fact that this world was to be defined in terms of and controlled by European progress. I, I just, uh, like what, what you were just reading, I. It's like they, they they take they take credit for things that they just define, but they didn't come from them. So everything becomes a product of white people, even though it didn't come from them. They just put a name on it. Yeah, absolutely. As I said, if you're going to, uh, I would not encourage cheating. I think, you know, the book is so comprehensive and she has so many uh, just little gems of wisdom uh, on every, really in every paragraph. Uh, I would really encourage just taking the time, even if you're a slow reader, you know, take the time. If you can't keep up and read uh, as at the pace that we're going, uh, one, you could speak up. We could slow down. Uh, or, you know, you could just take your own time and read it. But if it takes two months, three months, whatever, uh, I would invest the time to read the entire book cover to cover because it is very helpful. Uh, and as our caller said, uh, check out the diagrams as well. If you're feeling if you're reading a section or a chapter, or whatever, and you're feeling a little confused, uh, refer to the diagrams in the front of the book. They're there for a reason. Uh, they will help you, I think grasp the concept she also has a glossary in the front too uh where she defines some of the different terms that she uses uh so check that out as well Uh, i would also encourage folks to visit the uh footnote section so you can get some of the citations where she's getting that information from i thought it was wild that uh that quote from dr welsing was in essence magazine i cannot fathom going to pick up essence magazine or any other popular uh news item uh, that you can get at the grocery store and having an interview with Dr. Francis Cress Welsing. Like that is uh, like, wow, must have been a different time. I think that that essence interview was in 1971, if I remember correctly. Um, different uh, time on the plantation, because I can't see that t- sort of thing going down now. Um, at any rate, we're about at the three hour mark. Anybody have anything they wanted to get in before we uh, wrap up? No comment. Alrighty. Yeah, I guess it was a good session. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for participating. I hope people have been uh, keeping up with the reading. Uh, it's good to have folks chime in with their thoughts and observations uh, from the text. Uh, definitely appreciate it. Uh, we will be back uh, tomorrow. Uh, the compensatory call in, uh, 9 p.m. Eastern, uh, 8 p.m. Central, and 6 p.m. Pacific. Uh, Looking forward to catching up on the uh, latest news reports and just, you know, general observations, uh, what people are observing in their area of the plantation, uh, news items people have been catching up on, projects people are working on, uh, other findings and or concepts that people would like to share. Uh, And then again on Sunday, uh, the victims we've been or I've been referencing it uh, for the duration of 2012 uh, talking about escalating overt white terrorism against non-white people uh, some of the listeners uh, who were terrorized at the beginning of the year uh, in a restaurant a, a gang of racist thugs jumped them attacked them 
uh, just a really ugly uh, incident. One of those victims will be with us this Sunday uh, to just share how that ordeal has unfolded over the last six months. Uh, and I again hope that this drives home uh, when I say it is one of the worst possible combinations white people and alcohol. I'm not just saying that. It's not something to just go in one ear and out the other and, oh, we were just at, you know, whatever the local restaurant or what have you. We just wanted to get something to eat really quick and the white people, they weren't even thinking about us. So we go there all the time. Uh, when I say that, I'm not just saying it. It is a bad idea for a <laughs> a plenty of reasons. Um, a bad idea just economically. Dr. Kanban talks about your different selves. Economically, it is a horrific idea. You do not want to be investing in white people, uh, get together and hook up at home. You do not want to be giving these white people your money so that they can turn back and to continue to dominate us. Uh, in terms of what you put in your body, it is a insane idea and mental illness, as Malcolm X said. Uh, given what we know about white people, what Dr. Arne says, uh, to then go and allow a group of white people to go behind closed doors and prepare anything that you are going to put in your mouth. That is insane. Uh, and as we will see on Sunday, anything could go now uh, on the plantation when you are dealing with white people and especially white people who are inebriated. Anything could happen. Uh, there are numerous examples of this. Uh, white people uh, being intoxicated. They're out. They see some vulnerable black people. Oh, let's have a good time and go mess with them. Uh, it, I mean, it goes down all the time. So I hope that this broadcast will uh, encourage non-white people just to be serious. Uh, we are on the battlefield and you really cannot have times where you have lapses in judgment, uh, particularly lapses in judgment when you're around white people. Uh, it is asking for trouble. And uh, just keeping in mind that the reason I use the term white supremacy Non-white people have a history of fronting, not being truthful about the power that white people have over our lives. It is nothing to be proud of. It is very sad. But in order to change that, we got to be honest about that. We at least got to start from ground zero and acknowledge we are in an extremely weak position as it relates to white people. As Dr. Kanban says, they are waxing us right now. It does not take white people any time at all to totally ruin your life. And I wouldn't care who you are. President Obama, Michelle Obama, any other black person or non-white person in the world. Kofi Annan, cowbell ring. Uh, it, Kyogi, Kyogi, I need the phone. Um, yeah, it does, not, it does not take them any time at all. Uh, to wreak havoc and terrorism on non-white people anywhere in the world. Uh, and just being truthful about that. That's something we can't lie to ourselves about. You're going to hear this story. As I said, it is still unfolding. It's been six months. And they are still going through stress and strain and problems. All of this could have been avoided by just not going out uh, to be consuming food or alcoholic beverages in an environment with white people. All of this could have been avoided, but now we've had six months of unnecessary strain and strife uh, because of basically about seven minutes. Something that happened in seven minutes, just in seven minutes, white people can totally ruin your life. That'll be this Sunday. Uh, the program is uh, 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central, and 4 p.m. Pacific. Uh, again, I'm hoping that it will encourage people who listen to the program. Um, and I even take some of the responsibility myself because these folks listen to the program. And, uh, you know, maybe maybe we didn't do a good enough job uh, emphasizing uh, that you really cannot be out. You know, drinking with white people, you really are asking for trouble, uh, putting yourself in those types of situations. But that'll be Sunday and uh, we'll have a victim here to uh, give the whole breakdown and just how trifling and terroristic white people are. The Voltron principle will be in full effect. That's the other thing you got to keep in mind. Even if it's just one white person, even if it's just two or three white people, they have got an army of white people behind them. They are going to get on the same page and they are all going to be pointing at you as the other 
the object that is to be abused and terrorized. You got to keep that in mind. If I, I wouldn't care what other white people come to get involved, judges, attorneys, enforcement officers, if they're white, they are going to be allied against you if you are not white. That'll be Sunday. Thanks, everybody, for uh, tuning in. Looking forward to the broadcast tomorrow. Thank you, everyone, for reading participating call again again hopefully we'll have more participation next week from people keeping up with the reading uh next week it'll be uh 350 to 420 we're on the home stretch getting there 350 to 420 next week 350 to 420 next friday thanks everybody for tuning in context of white supremacy oh does anybody want to do the prayer i'll check before we exit um no (laughs) (laughs) right on we will uh we will give it to Dr. Ani. Uh, she has one at the beginning of the book. 2,000 Seasons of Restless Sleep Beneath the Destroyer's Fragmented Image. We used their definitions of ourselves to disconnect our consciousness. Lines drawn in denial of deeply textured souls. Okra ka se. Life, force, energy. Niyama. They knew even as we slept that our spirit was more powerful than their white death. In our will less sleep, we have allowed the earth to be defiled. The wake of 2,000 seasons of spiritless matter, destroyers work. Confusion in Ma'afa aftermath. Within our lost knowledge, enemies have blurred the line between us and them. Are we destroyers ourselves? No, we are the spring water, compelled by ancestral consciousness. Egun, Nimsam. Nimsanfo, issuing from Ani's womb, we divine a victorious destiny. Ifa, Odu, we are awakening, announcing ourselves self determining with Nubian will, crystal vision, shaping a new reality. Ancient genius rediscovered. So die the clear word. Balancing the scales, restoring spirit to matter. The whole completed made cosmic again. Rhythm is the key to the way. Alternating death with life, joining us to each other. We are the healers. The victory is ours. We call upon Onyame, Oldumare, and Ama, invoking the Nomo power of blackness, carried in the genes of race memory. Hase, ancestors and children to be born, keys to the circles of connectedness and clarity. Africa redeemed. The universe in harmony return and move forward to the way of a natural order, African world order, resplendent reflection of Ma'at. Ashe, we will be back tomorrow. Context of White Supremacy signing out.